All right, we'll call this Finance Committee meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here this evening. We start our meetings with the following land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mishasaga and Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. We'll now take 30 seconds to reflect. Please stand for the singing of the national anthem. And the Council for the City of Peterborough recognizes the principles contained in our Constitution and Canadian Charter and Rights of Freedoms. Hey, Mr. Clerk, any disclosure of pecuniary interest this evening? Mr. Chair, I see none at this time. All right. Up for consent this evening, we do have reports uh, 9A, B, C, D, and E. Tonight, they're actually just to receive for information. Uh, we will be discussing and debating them uh, next uh, Wednesday. I would just point out in the next week, if you do have any questions around these uh, these particular reports, uh, just send an email uh, to Mr. Freeman, and me, Mr. Freeman will direct it to the proper uh, um, organization, um, CAO, CEO, and uh, to, get, uh, to get answers, all right? So we, we will debate and discuss them next Wednesday, but in the meantime, if I can have just a mover to receive for information, moved by Councillor Baldwin, 9A, B, C, D, and E, we'll take a vote. That's all right. Huey, Councillor Mayor, you're, uh, you're comfortable with the yay? So the mayor's a yay, Councillor Hakey. Okay, Councillor Burke. No, take your time. No rush. That is carried. Thanks, everyone. So we do uh, we do have three presentations this evening. The first one is 8A, Peterborough Police Services 20, 2024 budget. And uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Drew Merritt. I'm the finance chair for the Peterborough Police Association. I had been on the board for one year, and being a business person, I thought that I'd be able to find some cost-cutting opportunities while still providing our citizens the quality of service needed. There are a few that we could find in this organization, but in fact, the Peterborough Police Service has been underfunded for over 10 years. We're treading water, and it is time for council to help us start swimming so together we can provide the service our citizens do deserve. I would like to introduce Chief Stu Betts to present our budget for 2024. All right, welcome, Chief. Thank you. Go 
Okay. Chair, what I'll talk to you tonight about is adequate and effective delivery of police service and public safety in our city. This is not enhancements. This is not what I'm talking about. Enhancements are nice to have. What I'm talking about is the delivery of the very important public safety and personal safety of policing. I'm not looking to enhance anything. I'm looking to provide the service that the community repeatedly tells me they want, and quite frankly, the service they deserve. I'll also point out that what's being sought is for the service to the community. I, we, get no personal gain from what we're asking for. This is about providing public service to the community. My presentation tonight, I suppose I need to, oh, my presentation tonight will predominantly be a reminder of what most of you will have already seen at the town hall that I made on September 18th. If you were not there and have had not the opportunity to view that, I would encourage you to do so as much of it is detailed over a two and a half hour lengthy presentation. You can find that on our YouTube channel for the Peterborough Police Service under the live tab. Your 10 minutes won't give us that full length of time tonight. What we'll be presenting is essentially where we are now through a budget that was passed to the present and where we need to get to in the future. In front of you here, not well-sized I'm afraid, screen. In front of you here is the uh, police net budget as a percentage of the city budget. In 2015, you'll have heard what the slice of the pie for the police was. Well, the slice of the pie in 2015 was 18.26%. It has continued to get smaller until 2023, where it sits at 16.80%. So far, through my research, I've not yet found a city in North America where police funding that was cut or limited did not see a, see a substantial rebound in the following years to help restore that sense of public safety. As we know, crimes do not reduce themselves when police are not sufficiently equipped and funded. We'll quickly and just briefly recap the community safety and well-being plan. I'll remind you that this is the city's community safety and well-being plan based on the city's survey of our community. Some will say that the number of respondents is not sufficient upon which to draw inference or any sort of ideas in terms of what the city actually wants. But these are in fact the numbers that the city is using to drive the community safety and well-being plan and the top five priorities moving into the current year. We cannot pick and choose. As we can see here, 67% of survey respondents in this city perceive that crime has increased in their community. Their perception is in fact reality. 50% of those survey respondents in the city would recommend their community as a good place to live. That means 50% would not. And 48% of the survey respondents said that they feel safe in this city. More than half of the respondents said they do not feel safe. We'll continue on with some more of those findings. So 86% of those respondents state that policing is very important or important to them. 71% said that the respondents in the city note that feelings of safety influence what they do and where they go. And again, half state that more police would make them feel significantly or quite a bit safer. So what have we been able to do? Well, we've been tracking how fast it takes us to get to an emergency. You will have seen me present this on the 18th of September. When I promised to come back to city council in January of this year, I promised to bring data and data is what I bring you so that you can make an informed decision. Our response to priority one calls for service has gotten slower. In the previous two years, our ability to get to a call for help, and that's our highest level of call. When you see the police going with lights and sirens, it used to be six minutes. It's now increased to 7.4 minutes. There are reasons for that. So what is our crime rate per 100,000 people? Well, as you will see before you here, let me see if I can't minimize this screen because it's blocking a little of your, there we go. As you will see before you here are our comparators in terms of size of city and police service. Peterborough is always green in, these, in this slide and the following slides. Kingston is always gray. Barry is the yellow, Thunder Bay orange, Guelph is that magenta and Brantford is blue. 
Ontario as a line is on is white and Canada is red. These are the places where, unfortunately, we're not doing so well. Because as you can see, in 2020, we were below the national crime rate per 100,000 people. We've been above the Ontario rate for several years. We have now exceeded the national rate of crime per 100,000 people. We're on the wrong side of the line. I'm tasked with getting us into the right. So where's that coming from? Well, our violent crime severity. So this is the crime severity index for violent crimes. Those are the people crimes. Those are the 911 help, I need help. As you can see in front of you here, once again, we are above many of our comparators. We continue to increase with the exception of, we've lost one screen, with the exception of last year, we had a minor dip in that, which is fantastic. That's moving in the right direction. Unfortunately, it's offset by the next slide. The next slide is the nonviolent crime severity. These are your property crimes. These are going to be the high volume low value for the most case types of crimes that are driving the community to the point of feeling as if it's unsafe, to feeling that their police aren't doing anything. I absolutely appreciate, I can understand where they're coming from. As you will see, we are again above the national and the provincial averages. This is not a place that we want to be. We don't want to be leaders in this category because as our crime rates are increasing, our clearance rates are dropping, our weighted clearance rates. This means what's our ability to solve these crimes. As one is going up, the other is going down. As funding is going down, crime is going up, clearance is going down. I was tasked with bringing adequate and effective policing to my board, and my board has supported me in presenting this budget to you. So where do we stand? No. Nope. Let's just make sure here, I think we may have skipped a slide. But where we stand is at a request for 15.3% to get us to the level of policing where we need to be to start to provide that adequate and effective policing. This is not a cost that we've just pulled out of the air. This is based on the needs of the organization. This is based on hiring 10 staff members to provide that adequate and effective policing. There is a new act coming. It has been proclaimed to come into force on April 1st. It is looming on the horizon. There are expenses coming with that. We have done our best to try and contain our other costs so that we can absorb those costs. Since this presentation was put together, I've received information from the Ontario Court of Justice talking about new disclosure requirements for the police to the Crowns to be able to get court cases through the system faster and within the timeline so we're not seeing them dismissed. I can't control that. I have to comply with that. That has been added to our table. There are other costs within the regulation under the new Police Services Act I cannot control. We provide tactical response in our, in our city. We support other communities who can't afford to do that. The regulations have been written as such to increase the requirements on a police service to be able to provide that. I've lodged my objection to that because I don't believe it's required as somebody who's managed an emergency response team in two police departments. And yet, I have no idea where that's going to fall. That will increase our requirement from 12 people to 18 people. This could put us out of that business. And I can tell you the Ontario Provincial Police are not in a position to provide that. The Durham Regional Police, our closest large Big 12 police service, is not in a position to assist us with that. These are things that we need to be aware of. So the unavoidable costs, you'll have heard me talk about this. You'll see since the September 18th presentation, we've actually managed to get this down 0.1% to 11.6 because we were able to identify some savings that we did. We were able to absorb this year. Uh, so we're actually just to keep the lights on at 11.6%. These are the costs we cannot control. Now, in addition to those increased costs for court preparation, you'll see on the first yellow line, OPTIC. OPTIC is the network or is the network of users, if you will, that manage our rep record management system and our computer-aided dispatch. They are increasing the licensing cost by more than 100%. Here, it was when we presented this, it was a 100% increase. 
I have just gotten the most recent estimate for that. I will be going to their annual user general meeting in December. It has gone up from this instead of $170 per user to $195 per user. I have no control over that. That is who provides record management service to the police. Now you might ask, why don't you just have your own chief? And I would love to do that. Unfortunately, the cost to invest in that is so significant that it would be irresponsible for me to bring that to you at this time, but it would be the ideal solution. There are additional costs on here that I know every other, every other agency board and commission is also facing. Increased costs for insurance, increased fuel costs, increased legal costs, things that we cannot control. So the strength impact, we're looking through this budget to increase our patrol, that's our frontline officers, by three. A technical officer, we have an officer who's actually taken from the front line right now to do this, which means that we are short on the front line to have an officer who can provide this service because we don't have that skill. This officer is that busy that is doing the technical side of those investigations right now. We need a forensic sergeant. Every investigation has a forensics component. We need somebody to manage that. We need police entry clerks. Every time we engage in an interaction with a member of the community, there are records that are created. There are special constables. You know that we're going to have to provide court security. We cannot control that. As the police of jurisdiction, we are required to provide that. When the Ministry of Attorney General shifted their courts and they added some more court space up to the, uh, to the Superior Court building, that came with it additional costs to provide security. We added magnetrometers to the doors. People have to staff that. That wasn't in the plan when we came forward with our court security. We don't have control over that, but the Police Services Act says we are responsible for providing that security. We get close to $1.6 million in grant funding to provide that. It's unstable. The way that funding is structured, it's provided to us based on essentially how inefficient you are or inefficient. The, least, the less efficient you are, the more money you get. We try and be as efficient as we can. We've actually made out pretty well, but that is not sustained funding in terms of being able to bank on it. We are always usually uh, in, the peer, in the process of having to either make up a little or have to hire to try and catch up to what that funding allocation is for. At that too, that's still not enough staff to staff that facility, and we will have to use other people to do that. Every single investigation involves evidence, digital evidence. Every single one of us in this room today has one of these. And I can tell you that every single investigation that we have has a digital evidence footprint. We are seizing devices, electronic devices. That stuff just doesn't transfer over to the Crown attorneys without somebody actually going through that. We have no control of that. Some of the disclosure costs I talked about is having to provide that information to the Crown in a timely fashion, which means we need people to pull that out and the systems analysts to help us with the IT side of all of that. So our 2024 operating budget looks like this. 90% of that time is on personnel services. That is not uncommon. And I've heard that in other boards and commissions, personnel services. This is an unavoidable cost in order to provide the types of service that we have to for adequate and effective policing. The other 10% doesn't leave a lot for discretionary spending, as you can see. Materials and supplies is 7.9%, nearly 80% of that 10%. Professional services at 0.7, training at, at sorry, professional services at 1.1, training at 0.7, not even 1% for training. And then the transfer to the reserves at 0.2%. I talked about our revenue, and as you can see, 52% of our revenue is derived from grants. The vast majority of that is that prisoner care control grant at 1.6 million. We rely on grants, in this case, to provide us our core police services. Grants should be treated as an enhancement. Grants should be the source for doing the things that you don't do with your core funding. We rely on grants just to do the basics. So here's where we stand in terms of our net operating budget over the last five years. And just another reminder, we're in green and our competitors are in the rainbow of other colors here. As you can see, we're always on the small end of where we 
and where the city of Peterborough funds their police. Now, the far right just shows you what the average increase has been for the past five years. Again, compared to our competitors, you'll see that we're quite small. And you'll see from those previous slides that our crime rates are quite high. That is a measure of a safe community, not how much we spend. Capital budget, of course, forms part of our uh, approach here in our budget request fleet. We need vehicles. We are embracing and moving towards the, the greening if we can to support the city. Hybrid vehicles is where we are looking to go. When we have administrative vehicles that can be flipped over, we will look to flip them to electric vehicles. They are costly. Every other police service is doing the exact same thing. We can't just go and buy an explorer off the lot. Those vehicles have to be police rated because they're engaged in pursuits and they have heavy duty equipment. That makes it difficult to come by. The last time we tried to buy hybrid vehicles, we got bumped. They simply did not have the supply for the, um, for the demand. As you can see, we have a request in for a facility to help us with the size of the facility we have now, which quite frankly, I am now staffing members of our organization into hallways. I've run out of hallways to put them in. I've co-opted every meeting room I possibly can and turn it into an office space for multiple people. We have a requirement to provide roadside screening devices. That's as you know, if you stop at a ride check and they ask if you've had anything to drink tonight and they ask you to blow into that little box, there has been case law that says you have to have that available when you stop and make that demand. You can't make that demand and then wait for somebody to bring that to you. It has to be in every car. So we have to get that into those vehicles in car cameras. Most of our vehicles have those in car cameras. Again, paid for by a grant, but not all. And if we don't get them in all, we run the risk of something happening in one of those vehicles that doesn't have it. And we know what will happen then is somebody will say, why did you use the vehicle without the camera? What are you hiding? And of course, increasingly like every other city, protests, crowds, are increasing and we also have a requirement to provide that crowd management capacity and response. This served us well at the head of the Trent. It was very effective and it's something that we were able to pay for this time around using old equipment that we were able to scrounge from the G20. You know how long ago that was. And when those officers did their training in that equipment and it's supposed to be fireproof, well, let's just say that was a one-time use. It is no longer usable for that particular function because that's the reality of what we deal with. So this is another recap of what the funding and the costs go to the fleet renewal, those IT systems and improvements and the other equipment that was outlined in the previous slide. Our request is that the police, Peterborough Police Services 2024 operating budget of uh, $35,775,187 or an increase of 15.3% uh, be approved by council. And then of course that our uh, 2024 capital budget request also be approved of $1.5,8,260. I think I tried to stay within the 10 minute allocation, but I am available for questions. No, that was great. Chief, thanks very much. And uh, Chief, did you wanna take a moment just to introduce who's with you here tonight? Fantastic, I will, thank you, because I may need to call on them uh, as my lifeline here. So of course I have our board chair, Mary Tendishat. You've already met uh, Drew, who is our uh, finance chair. I have acting staff inspector, Jamie Hartnett, who's my executive officer. The person who has all the number information, if you get too technical for me, I will be turning it over to Tia, who's our finance uh, manager. I will point out for the organization we have of 230 people, we have one person who does finance, not more, one who pays all the bills. So she's not allowed to buy lottery tickets because we need her to continue to work for us. <laughs> Sorry, Tia. And then of course with us, we have members of the, of the police association, and uh, Nikel, who's the president of the Senior Officers Association, Lee Hagley with our uh, Civilian uh, Police Association uh, with the PPA and representing the civilians and Brandon Edwards. So uh, oh, that's fantastic. Much. Well, thank you, Chief, and thank you all uh, for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, Chief, we do have some questions, if that's all right. So I have Councillor Real, Hakey, and Crowley. Councillor Real. Mm, through the chair to the Chief, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, at the present time, how many officers do you have off uh, injured or off work? 
So I'm glad you've asked that question because I think I know where you're going to go with that. And I will tell you that at the present time, I currently have, and I'm going to turn to there. And this fluctuates, of course, from day to day. It moves up and down. I currently have 29 officers who are non-deployable, fully deployable. Now, what I would like to point out is 6% of those who are off are off on WSIB. 6%. We know there are police services to the east of us that have 40% of their service currently off and away from work. The, national, the provincial average is between 10 and 12%. We're at 6%. And I've had two other officers who reached out to me just this week who said, I'm looking at coming back in the new year. I think I've made sufficient progress to be able to come back. Hopefully that answers your question, sir. To the chair, um, chief, how many people are off on presumptive legislation? Six percent. So that's six people. I tried to do some homework on presumptive legislation, and certainly I, I know the history of why um, the government of the day uh, instituted the provincial or uh, presumptive legislation. Um, but the world that I come from, and certainly I was the president of the largest union in Peterborough, um, certainly there was a the employer had to um, either find meaningful or modified work, retrain or I guess the worst case scenario is long-term disability. So is there a plan in place for some of these people to be find meaningful and modified work or retrained? Or I guess the worst case scenario is being pensioned off, let's put it that way. Chair, through you, I'll start with the easy one first. There is no pensioning off these folks who have injured themselves in the line of duty serving this community. That is not happening. They are not being pensioned off because they are off on an occupational stress injury as a result of their service to this community. That's just not happening. We do work with each and every one of these folks to bring them back into the workplace in a meaningful way. I can talk to you about the types of injuries that lead to this, and I appreciate where you had previously worked. I'm certainly familiar with that. My own in-laws worked in that, in that environment. I know what that's like. These folks do something different. And I won't get into the gory details of what they do, but I certainly could. And what they do and what they're exposed to through an accumulation of repetition of going to some of the worst types of calls, seeing the worst things that human beings can do to another person, far be it for me to decide when they're ready. We have members who've been shot. We have members who've had to shoot people. We have members who have picked up body parts on the side of the road and listened to people burning to death in a car. I could go on because it gets worse from there. Those folks are being worked on to come back to work. We are supporting them to come back to work. We have meaningful work for them to do when they do come back. And in fact, I have some plans to even try and increase the meaningful contribution that they can provide, not just to the police service, but to the community. So I do appreciate you giving me the opportunity to explain that to the rest of the people who are here today. Um, to the chair, and certainly that's where I was going because I, when you try to you know, kind of get into the weeds of presumptive legislation. And certainly I think you you did a good job of explaining this, but you you have asked for 10 new hires and five of them are civilian. Is there, you have a fully um, trained officer that's gone to either university or college, um, gone to police college. Is there any, um, is there any way of the five civilian jobs that these people would be retrained on those type of things with the background? They have in policing. Is there any? Is that an option that uh, that the police service is looking at, of retraining these people in those the five positions? Are I call them civilian part of it um, under the legislation? Certainly, they would have to be topped up to their salary. Uh, so there is not a loss of wage. But is there any? Uh, is that a program that the police department is looking into? So we will try and work with their limitations, restrictions as according and as described within their med with their medical professionals and through WSIB. Absolutely. The fact is we also have to be cognizant of crossing the associations, right? And when I say crossing them, we have a civilian a CBA, right? Collective bargaining agreement. We also have a sworn collective bargaining agreement. They're very different. And as you say, that you could top them up, but what we are talking about on the civilian side are civilian professionals. These are not just plug and play individuals that we can just put into those locations. Um, in many cases, we're hiring people who come with a skill set already in place. So if it were possible and if it were agreeable, uh, it's not something that we would be uh, that we would be opposed to. 
but it's highly unlikely given the specific skill set we're looking for. A senior systems analyst is an IT professional. That's not somebody that we're going to take a police officer who, for whatever reason, isn't able to return to full active police duties, or at least not right now, and be able to train them to become a computer programmer. Uh, it's, in a, it's, it's just simply not possible. Uh, we are working with them to support them coming back to the workplace in the profession and in the role that they signed up to do, and that's to serve the community as police officers. In part of your presentation, and you said tonight here that the call for service um, time frame has gone up. Um, has there any been any look, you know, I mean, I know it's $2.2 million for policing Calvin Monaghan and Lakefield, but um, how many officers are used in those municipalities? Um, that's equipment and officers um, that could be if we seem to draw those people back as opposed to being a community service for those two municipalities so, and using the officers in the city of Peterborough to help us lower the rate, the call for service. So uh, you would I know it's $2.2 million, yeah. um, but um, there's a, a cohort of officers that have to be used for those two municipalities. Chair, through you, you would, the city of Peterborough and the council would absorb 100% of those costs to provide that. Those municipalities pay for the policing that they are receiving, and a proportion of what they're paying for covers off a portion of the capital costs and the equipment costs associated to having those officers. So there is nothing to be gained by pulling them back. I certainly had considered that. I looked at that, and I thought, is there something to be gained here? Uh, it All it will do is shift the entire burden of that costing to this city. To, to continue to provide the policing that you require. It, it's not a cost savings, quite frankly, it's just shifting where the dollars are coming from and it's coming out of your pocket at that point, not out of the not out of the Cabin Monaghan and not out of Selwyn Township. To the chair, to the police chief, it's certainly um, budget time is an interesting time and certainly you get all kinds of calls, but I, I think um, if not weekly, monthly, I get this call. Why is a fully, um, First, or first class constable being used on construction sites with the equipment. I know that there's traffic control and all this stuff. Why couldn't an auxiliary police officer be used as opposed to a, a um, front or um, um, uh, first class constable that could be used to try and help us with the problems we have in the downtown as opposed to standing at a construction site? Could you answer that? Thank you very much and chair through you. Fantastic question. I'm glad you're giving me the opportunity to answer these questions that you're getting because those officers at those construction sites are paid for by those construction sites. Those are not on-duty police officers. Those officers are doing what we call paid duties. They're on their time off and somebody else is paying their salary while they're doing that job. That salary is not being paid for by the city, quite frankly. Uh, we also have restrictions around who can direct traffic. Auxiliaries are volunteers. They all have day jobs some cases night jobs, but they are volunteers and they do not have the authority unless they are being supervised by a police officer to do the very type of work that you're talking about. So hopefully this will help some of those inquiries that you're getting by being able to spread and, and share that word. Councillor Real, do you want to go back on the list? Sure, go ahead. Certainly um, you highlighted this uh, chief when your presentation at the Healthy Planet and my question will be, I'll paraphrase, it's not um, I haven't gone back and reviewed it, but I was there that night that you made a, I think somebody asked a question either from the floor or you brought it up that if the city of Peterborough did not give you what you asked, you were have the ability to take us to court. Um, do you remember that comment or um, am I just blowing smoke here? You are not blowing smoke, and what I was actually referring to, and I thank you brought that up, is a provision within the Police Services Act, which speaks to where the role of the Police Services Board uh, ends and where the city picks up and then where it goes back, should there not be an agreement in terms of what it requires to pay in order to provide adequate and effective policing. If the city does not support what the board is asking for, there certainly is a provision within the Police Services Act which will allow that to go before an arbitration to determine what the cost for that policing might look like. That is an expensive proposition. It's happened once. That was in the city of Guelph. It did not rule in favor of the city. It almost happened a second time, and that was in Smith Falls. And Smith Falls looked at falling crime rates 
or sorry, not falling crime rates, but cle uh, clearance rates. And they said, hey, we don't need as many police officers. We can reduce the size of that police service by one. And in fact, what they found out is you cannot. Because again, it went through and what they determined was crime rates are the measure of public's of adequate and effective policing. Our crime rates are going in the wrong direction to support that particular request. And what I don't want to do is see us get into a position where we're being asked to reduce the size of our police service. Of course, what happens after that is up to the board. I'm just here to provide you what the provisions are and I could take you to that section within the PSA, but I don't think you need me to do that right now. But it is there and you're quite right. Chair, I thank you for being here. Certainly, like I said, the budget time is an interesting time. Uh, all of us get inundated with these questions. I think this week was the one that yeah, I just asked, and that is the legislation part, you know, why don't you take them to court? So thank you very much for your answer. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Real. I have Councillor Crowley, Burke, and Duguay. Councillor Crowley? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thanks so much, Chief, for being here. Um, my question is, is um, or question, no, question is related to sort of the financials. Can you hear me? Uh, and just to pick up a little bit about what Councillor Riel said regarding the uh, the uh, services that the police provide to the county, how, how, how is that worked out? Is it a contract that we have with the county or police services have with the county? Chair, through you, I suspect there's a follow-up question, but yes, yeah. that is a contract with both uh, the Selwyn to provide policing services in Lakefield, and that is a contract with Kevin Monaghan for the same. And it, do we know how long that contract is when it comes up for renewal? They are both renewed. They are both on the books for another several years yet. I they are? One okay. is 2025, and I think the other is 2026. Um, there are provisions that as you make changes here to our budget, so too do those affect the uh, contract. And so they don't continue to get the same cost of the service delivery right. as prices and as, as the cost of policing is approved here in the city. It is applied to the contracts uh, accordingly. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, one other question that I had, uh, it was uh, related to, um, and I'm sure that you've probably had a lot of uh, calls about this because I know I have. Uh, back in the summer, I met with a few constituents in the West End regarding a neighborhood watch program people wanting to start a neighborhood watch. And I have some concerns about it, but I think that it's certainly a viable option, uh, even in light with what you have said, how there is just a, a, a lack of personnel on police services. So my question is, is something like neighborhood watches having people in the community band together to however they do it. Do you have any recommendations for something like that? Do you think it's a bad idea? Do you think it's a good idea? And is there sort of a template people can follow if they want to do something like that in their community? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Great question. First off, I'll start with the easy answer. I absolutely support Neighborhood Watch, uh, but let's put the, let's emphasize the key word is watch. It's not engage. It's neighborhood watch. It's it's people watching out for people. It's providing some of what we lost, quite frankly, when our communities emptied during COVID. When everybody was home, we lost a natural surveillance. We lost people who just happened to be out and about. Neighborhood watch is talking about that. It's people doing, uh, looking out for each other, looking out for their neighbors. It's certainly a, something that exists. It's, it exists in police services. We are prepared to help to start up those types of uh, those types of community groups. Um, they can be challenging, I will tell you, because it does take a fair amount of coordination and somebody has to own it. And it's not the police, it's a community-based program. But I absolutely support it because I think that the more eyes that are watching, the safer everybody feels. Just one more question, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that. Um, the, the last question that I have is related to if there is an, um, an emergency in one of the counties that requires an extended amount of police action, let's say, or investigation. Um, does that specific county then pay the cost for that if there are numerous officers on location for an extended period of time? So there are provisions within those contracts that allow for additional cost recovery, including overtime if overtime is required in those areas. So yeah, there are some provisions for that. Likewise, if we pull officers from the county into the city, 
I have to report to them why we've done that and the reasons for it. They don't seek a cost recovery, but there certainly is an accountability by the police chief to the uh, to the mayors in each one of those areas to say, hey, you've paid for this service. Here's why we did, weren't able to provide it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Carley. Councillor Burke to Gabe Mayor Leal Lachica. Councillor Burke. Um, thanks through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to Chief Betts. Um, you know, definitely nothing personal. Municipalities across Canada and the province are all in this position, which feels sort of like a stalemate, even though you're fully prepared to answer all of our questions. Um, it feels to me like we're just stuck to, to have to do this. And um, so with that being acknowledged, I think that this is a good time to publicly talk about some things. And um, a lot of the statistics that were used about well-being and stuff, like there's some flexibility to go different directions with that. And I see in your presentation, you've gone to um, to use it to uh, justify the, some of the positions you're, you're asking for and things like that. Um, so I have a few questions around that. But my first question is about your, because I remember at your town hall, you were talking again in, in, in a little bit of a vagueness at the town hall about the IT. Oh, it's water. I got, I got a, yeah. Um, so one of the things in the town hall you talked about was your relationship with our in-house IT and you're asking for some IT positions. You commented on that from a question by the last speaker. Can you talk about your the police's relationship with the city of Peterborough's IT department? Thank you and chair through you. So our relationship is good. It's not great. And when I say that, it's because we have very specific needs. And it's not to say that the people that the city employs to perform IT services are not competent, because I do believe they are very competent. And I know that they are challenged to provide the services that they provide just for the city. What I need is very specific policing services. And that is where we struggle. Because city IT people are not police IT people. My records management system requires a very specific skill set. Now, the city provides this one full-time person who's employed and stationed in the station. And you'll have heard me talk about that in January of last year when I talked about that individual. And in fact, in February, I said he's probably landing, coming back from Mexico right now, where he takes his laptop computer to be able to service us when he's out of the country, because we don't have that support otherwise. And through the chair, though, are you not also receiving the benefit of our full in-house IT department on top of that one staff member? In increments, not in the way that you might think we would be. No, because there are certain hours and certain performances and functions that we can get from the city, uh, but it doesn't translate into pay us more, you get more. It's you get into the queue with everybody else. Uh, consider we pay, I think we're now at about $327,000 as a transfer payment that we make back to the city for IT services. One of that pretty much pays entirely for the single individual who's over there. The rest is around some of the behind the scenes. We share a number of programs. So we will never totally separate from the city in terms of IT support. Thanks, and then through the chair, a question I had, um, which was sort of inspired by those, the, the respondents from the community safety and well-being. Um, and again, you know, my my thing is that public safety can be th found through a lot of ways and a lot of ways that the city supports. Um, I guess, are you aware that by asking for this much of an upheaval of a hit for our budget, which is mainly going to be covered by our residential tax base, um, are you aware of the implications uh, in that with the other things that the city can do? Um, because in your town hall, you know, you, you'd spent a lot of time going over how the police are burning up a lot of its resources responding to community-based issues. And my fear is that um, by almost acting like a tetherball going in this one direction with this budget to fix you, um, we're going to be missing out on, on things in the other direction, um, which, again, you're going to have to continuously make up for. Have you gone to your board and considered it through this lens to find out if there's any efficiencies, if there's any costs that can be done to spread out over time to save the city um, from this big hit all at once? Thank you for that, because I think we all believe in prevention in any form, in every form. Policing and law and public safety is no different. Prevention is always cheaper than the response. The problem is we're not able to provide the prevention either. So until we can, somebody has to provide the response. It would be irresponsible for me not to have considered what some of those implications are, and I certainly have. So I do appreciate you asking about that. 
I have a demand on service right now. I know because you get those demands and you pass them on to me, as does most other councillors here. The community has expectations of public safety. That's my job. And I have to be able to provide that until there are other social safety net services in place to look after the front end. That tether ball, I, I get it. But when you talk about efficiencies, and I showed you where we sit in terms of the net percentage of the city's tax levy has continued to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And so efficiencies have been found. But what we've done is we've pushed that to the limit. We've robbed Peter to pay Paul, and now the bill is due. And I don't like to put it that way, but the fact of the matter is, we have run out of efficiencies to have. Um, thanks, thanks for that. A couple more questions. Um, I think that you talked about the public's expectation, and I think that you've done a great job at answering the public and being political and being on Twitter and um, really showing up so that the public has um, some transparency with what you're doing. Um, what, like publicly, what can the public expect? Because my fear is that the public's expectations by the amount of money that it's going to cost us for this will still not be met. The type of the type of response that I'm hearing from my constituents and the public is that the type of response they're looking to, to um, more so reflects like a private security response. Um, I know that it's conjecture, but it is what I'm hearing. Um, and it's that small businesses are calling, the police aren't showing up, um, a resident on Dalhousie and Elmer called. Uh, they were they were feeling like they were being threatened, um, and they were they were told by the dispatch that to tell your counselors to pay us more money and we'll come. Um, I know that that's conjecture, but these are the kinds of calls that we're getting, um, and and there has to be some truth to that. And you mentioned that you have issues of capacity. Um, can the public expect to see like a real response um, by this budget being increased? Thank you for that. And I do appreciate that because I've had similar conversations with people and I've had a business owner who actually said to me, chief, I called three times on this date and your police did not show up. And I said to that particular individual, because I've had a number of calls with that person. I said, I hope you're not lying to me because now that you've put that down, I will go and check. Well, guess what? We showed up. He canceled that call once. We showed up on another occasion that same day, and on the third occasion, we actually gave somebody a ticket for trespassing. And yet, when you say there has to be some truth to it, there's another example on the other side where this person was adamant. Now, that person's never called me back because I told him I would be fact-checking that. Now, what can they expect? And I'm glad you asked because this is important. I absolutely, and when you talk about what business owners want, I think what we're talking about are those types of crimes that aren't necessarily people crimes, but what we would classify as property crimes, right? The damage to property, the theft, shoplifting, theft from vehicles, those types of things is what's coming up. So I am happy, and I will be announcing this to the community through a media press release tomorrow. We are going to launch an initiative now, I can maintain this in the winter months because that's when I have the maximum amount of staffing. There's just nobody on training and nobody who's on vacation. I can maximize that by creating a new community property unit, by taking an officer from every platoon and assigning them to do this particular work, and that is property investigations. Those types of things that you're talking about that the community is saying, we are not getting the response from the police. I have a plan. I will outline that fully tomorrow in a media release to the, to the community. It is sustainable with the officers that you see me asking for, but it is a plan that I can provide, that I can sustain. To Councillor Riel's point, it involves helping to bring back people who are currently off work by engaging them in meaningful work that is related to policing, by helping them do some inside investigative work to funnel and to feed the frontline officers who will be tasked with this particular response. It is a response that I think our community will appreciate. They will, they will uh, see an uptick and a response from the police. And as I say, I'll have a full plan and a briefing for that tomorrow. So I would certainly welcome you. We'll be there at 1030 tomorrow. And if you want to come over and join us for that, or you just want to tune in to see the, uh, the release, please do, because I will be making that fully available to, uh, to the media tomorrow. And uh, I think that the community will be well satisfied with what I can provide. Hey, you know, now's the moment we're looking for efficiencies. You have the mic if you want to tell us the plan. Um, I think it's a great time, but um, I'll leave that to you. Uh, you know, I did a little digging too, because like I don't, I'm a guy that doesn't necessarily always fully trust the, t the statistics. And um, I haven't, can you just verify that this is true? Because 
I'm, I, w- I was a bit of like a Google Matlock with it. Okay, I'm no professional. Um, but haven't the overall uh, crime severity, hasn't the overall crime severity index actually gone down significantly um, from like two- 1991 to 2013? And then it started to go up a little bit. Overall, isn't it significantly low, significantly lower from that 1990s, 2000s period? So Google, to some degree, has served you well. So what you have seen is a drop in crime severity from those times that you've talked about to about 2014. So that's the key, the key year now, 2014, and we started to see an uptick again. So what we did see during that particular period of time is we saw a decreasing of funding towards police because what people said is, oh, look, crime's going down. We don't need as much to fund our police. Now what has happened is we've seen a rebound and crime is going up and police are now trying to catch up. And this has been part of the problem. So you're not entirely wrong. That has gone down. Murder rates have gone down. But it is on the increase up. And we are seeing that here. We are not immune from that. And in fact, our crime rates have gone up more than others. Councillor okay. Rick, do you want to go back on the list? Go right back on the list. Yep. Yeah. I have Councillor Duguay, Mayor Leal, Councillor Lachica, Crowley, and Burke. Councillor Duguay. Thank you, Chair Beamer, uh, Chief Betts. Thank you, as always, for your uh, presentation and attendance in our chambers. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Merritt's attendance. So I think he's traveled from far away climates to join us this evening. So thank you, Drew. I have, um, Chief Betts, I have four questions. Um, the You referenced the recent community survey. What were, can you advise council the number of persons that participated in that survey? Chair, through you, it was over. It was in the neighborhood of 570 some odd participants who responded to the city's survey. Uh, we didn't run the survey, so I don't know what the final numbers on all of that are. I just know that we are affected by it. The Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan exists within uh, the policing uh, requirements, but we're just a stakeholder. It's the city's plan. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Um, a statistic that is referenced on your PowerPoint presentation speaks to, and I don't think your screens are, just a moment, they are paginated. So it would be uh, just by uh, number 11. And it states 15.3% uh, budget increase equals $78.87 per household. Is that a per capita or does that represent per rate pair? Sorry, Chair, I'll start over. This is where I'm going to ask for uh, Tia uh, uh, to join me here, if you would, so that she can explain to you that. That is fine. Good. Thank you. Maybe, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Just people at home may be listening as well. Good. So, yeah, right now, so as you can see, the um, where the city stand, uh, the baseline is 5.5. And then if we, uh, for us, the, the difference between the 15.3 and 4.08%, uh, that's an additional of $78.87. Uh, uh, that would be per um, house, the median assessment at uh, 260000 Or if you say for per 100000 would be about $30, less than $31. Thank you, uh, Chief. The reason I query, because per household to me means something vastly different than, uh, for example, on a rate pair basis, because we don't have, I was trying to do the math, and we don't have that many rate pairs, but I understand that that increase, therefore, represents an additional, call it $80, if that's what I've heard. All right, thank you. Um, in line, then, thank my you. third question, um, my third uh, question um, the uh, in line with uh, my colleague, Councillor Crowley, so Cavan Monaghan Township and then Selwyn vis a vis Lakefield specific, um, where they will those cities be facing those, excuse me, townships also be facing a 15.3% budget increase. So, Chair, through you, as I mentioned, they are also impacted by whatever the City Council here approves for our budget. They also have to pay the same difference. So I can't tell you exactly the wording of what those contracts say. I'm, I'm sorry I don't happen to have that in front of me, but there are provisions within the contracts that as, uh, as the cost is increased here, so too does it increase within their contracts. 
but if if I can specifically, would it be fifteen three percent of cent fifteen point three percent or would it be less? I don't have the contract in front of me to be able to tell you that very specifically, but there would be costs that would go to them as a result. And it would be proportional to the cost of the increase of policing per officer. They pay per officer and they pay a proportion of the capital to provide that. Mr. Chairman was my next question. I'm happy to hear there's a proportionate contribution on the capital side. Um, I lastly, um, you have a statistic earlier in your presentation, page three. And it references specifically the police net budget as a percentage of the city's budget. And while it, it has decreased, um, Chief Betts, would you also could you not agree that since 2015, the last nine years, there has been there have been several additional community services added to the city's budget? Sorry, you'll have to help me with that. So, I wasn't here up so, until this year. So, from your experience if I might add, in other communities, London specific. Uh, your experience in London, part of your time in Peterborough, I'm sure you observed that the city was caused to add uh, expanded municipal services. So uh, thus, uh, while your percentages decrease, would you not agree or could you not agree that the city of Peterborough is now offering an expanded more services across the board than we did in 2015? I would have to defer to you in terms of what the city of Peterborough has done, what other municipalities have done. I can speak specifically to the city of London and to York Region, because that's where I have experience during the time period that you're speaking of. Certainly, they have invested in other uh, services, but I also know that their, their um, tax models are different than the city of Peterborough. I know how they have assess is different. I know that the city of London has a what they call an assessment growth, where growth pays for growth. So they have a percentage of money that goes to some of those services that comes from development charges directly to developers. So it's not a straight apples to apples comparison, but I can tell you that in those other municipalities there have been increases. I would assume the same has happened here in Peterborough, but I have, cannot speak with any level of authority and I would have to ask others to answer that. Uh, Chair Beamer, it may have been an unfair uh, question, uh, but I did note in your presentation, you do reference a percentage of the net budget, and it would be my observation that, in fact, the city has had to, through other, through provincial mandate and community need, which your agency is also appropriately responding to, I might add, um, we have been faced with the same predicament in terms of adding other uh, city services. Um, those are my questions, Chair Beamer, and again, Chief Betts, thank you for your presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Councillor DeGay. Mayor Leal? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, Chief Betts and the team, thank you very much uh, uh, for your presentation. I shouldn't speak for uh, Councillor Baldwin, <clears throat> but I think it's important to get on record that Councillor Baldwin, myself, uh, supported this budget at the Police Services Board, and, and we'll advance the arguments uh, uh, when the discussion starts in the not too distant future. I have a couple of questions. The first question, Chief, and maybe uh, Tia can answer it, but if you could help us out here. The continuous depreciation of reserves of the Police Services Board, how has that put our service made it much more vulnerable uh, as we look at policing in our community? The constant rating of reserves over a significant period of time. I could speak to that in a way that may not be financial. <laughs> so I'll start and then I'm gonna ask Tia to join me. But I can tell you that hasn't been favorable for uh, policing, it has not been favorable to the city. We have pushed and we have pushed the, the ball down the field, if you will, if we can use that as a metaphor and things have come due. Quite frankly, um, we have depleted the ability to pay for things as they come up. Frankly, it's artificial accounting. Absolutely. And if you need a numbers accounting of what that looks like, I would turn to Tia, but... Please do. Up today, uh, the account, the balances for us, uh, we have a balance of uh, $1,053,228.43. Of this, the uh, the amount restricted for the capital project uh, like spoken for uh, is five hundred seventy-two 
$1,156, and the amount that available uh, for board uh, discretion, uh, $481.072. Uh, so what happened here is that, um, as you know, what we do with our budget as, as with the city, um, um, Richard already also mentioned in his report, we base our, our estimate based on today information. Uh, we, because of our budget is so, uh, so tight, we didn't really account for inflation, even to add in another 2% increase. So that's where our, we're facing a number of budget risk uh, per se. So the 481,000 uh, easily absorbed by other um, increase in supplies or unknown factors. Thanks very much, um, Chief. I guess my next question, um, and I appreciate your answer to Councillor Burke, uh, uh, with the new unit that will be addressing property crime and, and the retrieval of property. Uh, my question is, um, key performance indicators. Will you as Chief provide a quarterly summation of, of uh, the KPI uh, because of the investment we're prepared to make uh, into this new unit? Fair through you. Absolutely. As you know, uh, I provided to the board in a very public session, and I'm prepared to do so to council what the results of our first month of Safer Public Spaces looks like, and have committed to do so on a quarterly basis uh, to the direction of my board. Uh, I would certainly apply the same approach to what this would look like in terms of key performance indicators, because anything implemented needs to have proper KPIs and metrics to determine whether or not it's working. Uh, what I am proposing is a one-year pilot, if you will, with a two to four month study period, if required at the end. I think what we will find is that we will have an immediate result. We won't need that two to four months to tell us that this is working. Because I know if we can dedicate officers to investigate these crimes, which quite frankly, the officers who are working now don't have time to do, they will be solved. It just, it, that's just how it works. And our officers, I, I can tell you right now, have, uh, they are busy responding to calls as they come in those priority one calls that I talked about, those priority two calls. And so what falls off the radar are the property calls that Councillor Burke talked about, the ones that people feel frustrated. I call them high volume, low dollar value, high aggravation calls, because for those who are impacted, it is probably the one thing that they are most aggravated. Most people will not come in contact with the police through a violent crime, but very many will experience some sort of a property related crime. And what I want to be able to do is to provide a proper, adequate and effective response. That's my responsibility under the Police Services Act. What I'm coming to the council with through my board is a plan to provide adequate and effective policing so that we can respond to this type. So thank you. Thanks very much, Chief. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, the, in conversations I've had with the public, uh, I continue to um, indicate uh, from my perspective anyways that the investment in this police budget is going to achieve results investment equals results i think that's what the community wants thanks very much mr chair thank you very much mayor leal Councilor chica uh thank you very much uh, mr chair through you to chief betts uh good to see you this evening and and thanks to you and your team for for bringing the presentation forward the visuals are really great it really helps uh um, helps us see um, the facts and, and the, the statistics and the changes over time. Um, with, as, as environment chair, I was, I was pleased to see that, um, you know, the fleet renewal has included that consciousness of, um, you know, hybrid patrol vehicles going forward. My question is, um, with police services in a municipality and our municipality, do you have consultation and communication with um, that service area here within our city? Because we have such expertise around GHG emissions and goals and net zero by 2050 and a new climate action plan that's upcoming. Has there been an opportunity to consult about this number, three vehicles, and, and what's the plan going forward? How do you come up with this number? Thank you. Thank you, and through through you, Chair. So the three that we need are three replacement vehicles. We're going to replace gas guzzling SUVs with hybrids. So, and we also are very much aware of what the city's greening initiatives are, and uh, that would is exactly what you would expect us to do. Our fleet manager does communicate with the city's fleet 
folks, so we are aware of that. Our needs are different. Uh, what you need in terms of a vehicle for the city uh, is different than what we need in terms of a police first responder vehicle. Now, as I talked about administrative vehicles, we are the same because those are the vehicles that we drive to and from a location. A 24 hour police response vehicle that's also pursuit rated and has the extra heavy duty equipment is something that's a little harder to come by. And unfortunately, your folks aren't able to provide us with that support, although they do provide us with service support and things of that nature. The three right now are replacement. I'm not looking to replace vehicles until they are due to be replaced. I simply don't have the money to do so, but I'm prepared to accept money if that's what you're offering. Um, th thank you for that and just supplemental, Mr. Chair. So um, currently you do not have any, any uh, electric vehicles, is that correct? We have hybrid vehicles, we okay. don't have fully EV vehicles, and we don't have the infrastructure across the road to be able to support fully e electric vehicles. Again, I'm open. So there are no charging stations currently at, at your facility? That is correct. So that is included in, in the price that's indicated here, if that's necessary for 2024? No, these are not plug-in hybrid vehicles. These are the other style of hybrid vehicle that recharges through passive uh, use. So just to clarify then, there is ongoing consultation with our expertise here at the city around fleet replacement? Our fleet replacement is specific to us. There is not consultation in terms of asking the city how we should replace our fleet because that's unique to us. Uh, but we do speak to the fleet services folks here at the city in terms of the service and some of the other uh, assistance that we can get from the city in that service. But we don't seek their permission nor their uh, advice on police vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Lachica. Councillor Crowley? Uh, just one further question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more, and then I'll shut up. Um, during the public information session, and even tonight, you made mention of how important personnel replacement is in police services and how deficient we are. Um, so should we, I know you don't predict the future. I wish you did because I ask for a lot of numbers. But saying that, um, do you foresee this um, robust sort of budget coming through year after year in order to get the levels up to where you think they need to be? Should we maybe expect a larger budget next year or for the next few, do you think? Chair, through you, I'm not thrilled having to bring you this budget. So it's not my plan to bring you the same budget next year. I for goodness sake, hope that isn't the case. And although I can't foresee the future, I can tell you it wasn't my plan to bring you the budget that we have here. I inherited a certain amount. We spoke about reserves. Uh, it's not my intention to do so again next year. I appreciate that. I just know that from the, the presentation, 90% is personnel and we are, um, for the presentation, short. So I was just curious as to whether or not that would be moving into the future. So thank you so much for asking. Or for answering. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Councillor Crowley. Councillor Burke. Um, thanks, uh, through Chair Beamer to Chief Betts. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the public perception. What's the best way for the public to engage with the police and help um, have you guys understand your priorities, the, the public interest and the priorities of the public? Well, that's quite timely because we're the board's in the middle of doing a strategic plan and has uh, asked for survey responses to our, to inform the board on what our priorities should be. Uh, we always contain the priorities within the Police Services Act. Those are the five main pillars. But in terms of how we operationalize that, the, the board is constant and currently seeking input from the community to help direct their strategic plan. Thanks. And this just a follow up question, um, because you mentioned this, the community safety and well-being plan a lot um, to substantiate some of the graphs that we looked at. Um, one of the things that was sort of really that was really shocking for me to be not um, dealt with in a direct way was um, the fact that Peterborough has like one of the highest per capita in Canada rates of hate crimes. Um, so how are you guys, um, how are you guys responding to that? Because it, it feels like it's a big issue for us here that um, isn't being addressed in a meaningful way. I'm sorry that you feel it's not being addressed in a meaningful way. Uh, I can tell you that our hate crime investigator and our hate crime analyst are paid for by a grant. We don't have the funding to provide that as a core service in this city. So the province is funding that for us. Um, that's a problem. As I said, our grants should be our enhancements. 
unfortunately, we rely on the grants to provide the basic core function. So we have dedicated hate crime investigator. We have dedicated crime analysts for hate crime and they're paid for by the province. And we do do that in a very meaningful way. We have made an arrest, as you know, in relation to a series of events that happened here in our city this past summer. But here's the trick. We can't lay certain hate crime charges without the approval of the Ministry of Attorney General. We have a request sitting downtown at 720 Bay Street right now, waiting to be approved so we can lay these charges. And what I'm speaking to are those scrolls that were being dropped around anti-Semitic messaging across our community. We identified a person, we found the evidence, we've made a request, and now we wait. So if you feel that it's not being responded to, I would welcome any support to help move that forward because we've done what we can, we've advanced it as far as we can. We need 720 Bay Street, Ministry of Attorney General's office to give us the permission. And I don't make that rule, that's in the criminal code. Once we can, we can advance that and bring some closure to that and to the hurt it's caused that particular community. I guess through the chair, you know, I my experience is from not just these types of forums, but it's from connecting with um, racialized groups of people and vulnerable people in our community and, um, you know, how those groups feel their relationship is with the police. Um, I, I see a correlation between that and the the rate of hate crimes which we have in the city and and as as part of a piece of the puzzle of of the operational like duty of the police and i was just uh, asking about how um how a does the public um best communicate with the police this need for that um service or handling or lens to look through and then b um how is the police responding to um how those groups feel so thank you for that. What I can tell you, and I can't speak to the correlation you're talking about, that's your experience with that. And if people are having that feeling, they need to bring it to us. Uh, but what I can tell you is there's online reporting for hate crime incidents right, that don't reach meet the threshold. And sometimes that's underreported. We know it's underreported. People need to tell us. You'll hear me say the phrase, if we don't know, we can't go. Right. So if people aren't reporting those incidents that re don't rise to the level of criminality, we can't address them. And then, of course, if it is a hate crime, we certainly have people that will investigate that. And as I've just outlined, we do have a hate crime investigator who gets all of those and reviews and deals with and investigates those. And just um, finally, um, there's been some debate about this. Is Can you talk to us about the area of the city that has the most calls for service, please? So I can tell you, because I happen to have a graph that I'm looking at right now, this is uh, as of today. So the current, and this changes and it fluctuates, currently area four is accounting for 23.14% of the dispatched calls that the police have gone to. Area one is at 22.88, area two at 22.98, and area three at 22.13. The remainder are made up through Kevin Monaghan and Lakefield. So. That's by proportion of police boundaries, right, of what we have. You can see that on our maps. I think what might be disproportionate here for some in terms of perception is that area one, the downtown area, is feels it's very much compressed. So that 22% is taking place in a smaller area. But in terms of workload on the police, currently area four, which is in the west, is keeping us the busiest by a small amount. But it's nearly equal across this city. I think the confusing part we had in the town hall we had heard that the north end was receiving the most and so um it changes and, I, and also our perception of those wards is very different than um you know, i'll do my research and look at what you're talking about with your different areas um yeah go ahead so what i would direct you to if i may is go back to my town hall meeting and you'll see that i overlaid your town ward map on top of the police map. So if you're curious where you sit in, re in regard to where the policing boundaries are, I've done that work for you. You don't have to do that. And it's currently sitting right there in that presentation. And then my final question, please, thank you. Um, how, many police, how many police officers are on patrol right now in the city tonight overnight? Thank you for that question. I, I could look up and tell you on my phone, but I know that our minimum staffing is 13 on a night shift. It, no, no, I'm going to break that down. 13. Now, two of those officers on a night shift go to Cabin Monaghan because they pay. 
for two officers. That salary is paid for, so they're out of that 13. One goes to Lakefield. So now we're down 13 down to 11, 11 down to 10. And one officer has to be on the front desk because when people come into the station, we need an officer there who can help them. So now that you're down, if you've done the math, you're now down to nine in the city of 86,000. And I would ask you, sir, are you satisfied with that? Finally, is how many will that change? Well, how will that number change by this budget ask? Will it change? Can we expect a change in that? What you can expect is I'm going to be able to put four officers who will be dedicated to doing property crime. Because we've asked for these officers within this budget ask, those four officers essentially will be added to the front line of policing. They will be deployed in a way that will be described tomorrow that will work with our workload curve. So as I promised this council, data drives my decisions. I have a workload curve. I know when the work happens in this city and we will deploy out those particular resources in accordance with that workload curve, which supports the officers who are working. Thank you very much, Councillor Burke. Councillor Purnell and then Hakey. Councillor Purnell. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief. Um, I want to go back to uh, Kevin Modigan Lakefield contracts, if we could, for a moment. I think part of the confusion is that in our report, um, it says the fees and grants um, for them would be increasing 4.6%. Um, it's on page 11 of our agenda. Um, however, you have said twice tonight that it's going to be, it's not in your report, sir, it's in our report, page 11. So, but that's what we've read in, in our report. So I think that's why the question came up and, and you've answered that if, if we approve 15%, they will pay proportional, to, more proportional to, towards the 15%. Is that correct? Chair, through you, that is correct. And as I mentioned, they pay part of that cost recovery is a component of the capital associated to the vehicles, to the equipment, and everything else. Okay, fair enough. And I appreciate you addressing that. Um, I, have, I have two other questions, and really these are more for public education and perhaps some of our newer colleagues around the table. Um, and, and perhaps you can confirm for me if this has changed in any way. But my understanding is um, those contracts with our, our neighboring municipalities really cover basic policing. But if there's a significant crime, like unfortunately a murder that just recently happened, that is an additional cost that is, doesn't go towards the Peterborough, city of Peterborough taxpayer, that municipality pays those extra costs. Is that still correct, sir? They do pay a portion of that. I mean, they don't pay the salary of those particular individuals who are providing that particular service, but they do pay proportionally. And for overtime costs, they also there's a cost recovery to that as well. Okay. And I don't have the exact wording. I'm sorry, but I was unprepared for that question. Okay, no, I didn't think of it until tonight. Sorry. Um, and can you tell us where the revenue goes from speeding tickets? I think people are interested in hearing that answer as well. Thank you, and through the chair, uh, I can tell you where it doesn't go, and it does not come back to the police service. Uh, we make no money on speeding tickets whatsoever. That's a municipal uh, responsibility. We lay those tickets, and when people pay those tickets, it it is uh, for the municipality. So we don't get any revenue from that whatsoever. Okay, thank you. I think it's just important that people understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councilor Brunel. Councilor Aiki. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and through you to the Chief. Uh, one question, then some comments. Red light cameras, is there a future? Do you see them in our future here in Peterborough? Chair, through you, I would actually look over my right shoulder to, uh, to my friend and CAO to ask whether or not that's in the city's future because the police have no say in whether or not you, uh, you choose to enact them. I think they can work well as a deterrent. I know where the top 10 collision intersections are because we get all the motor vehicle collisions. I presume that they are shared with the city. If they are not, we are fully prepared to support that and to share that with the city because I do think people need to, uh, to be careful. That's my lane, public safety, traffic and road safety, and I would support that. Okay, thank you. And a couple comments, if I can, Mr. Chair. Uh, during the election, all I heard about was uh, downtown in particular, but crime, and that people wanted it fixed. I, I, I want to say the open air drug use policy, which I experienced downtown, that's where our business is located, has changed things. It has changed just in the last month or so. Um, and that's, it's changed very positively. 
I will say. Um, the property crimes, and you and I had talked about it, uh, the property crimes are very personal to people. And uh, I think that this is something that will reflect with the uh, electorate that told us they want these things taken care of. Um, the problem that I've always had, I'm, I'm going to support your ask, by the way, but the problem that I've always had with the way that our system is set up is you and the city both are put into a position by, and I'll be honest, the provincial government that makes all the rules, that changes and adds, and you pay. So you're asking, they're telling, you, you come to us and ask, which I think is very unfair, actually. Um, I don't know what we can do about that, but I wanted to thank you because you've got a job that you couldn't pay me enough to do. So uh, I appreciate it. And I know that I've heard from the citizens uh, about the open air drug use policy because I'm walking downtown quite extensively all the time. And I'm sure I'm going to hear about the property crimes unit. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ricky. Any further uh, questions for the presenter? Uh, just one question, Chief. Um, I'll do some comments too. I, I too am hearing very positive feedback for the illicit open air drugs. So thank you for that. And I think the uh, property investigation will be very positive. The number one issue I heard during the election was around crime safety, clean up the downtown. And I think, uh, as you said, the key indicators are critical, the accountability. So, uh, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, we're, we're all receiving a lot of emails and calls around uh, uh, a large, um, not only a police ask, but just a, a city tax increase. Um, there have been a few letters to the editor. Can you just maybe talk about um, the KPMG report, which recommended 13 new hires, and then senior staff that recommended 65. Um, they did reduce it to 50, but that seems to be a staggering difference. So um, can you maybe just men talk about why such a staggering difference between the K KPMG uh, recommendation of 13 new hires and senior staff recommending 60, 65? Thank you, Chair. And what, what I'll be able to speak to is my research as I prepared to come here. So the KPMG report actually came out at 49 new hires over the course of five years. That took into account frontline or uniformed officers. They did not study the impact of the required support staff to support that 49 officers. Uh, so there's a disparity there in terms of what's required. Um, in terms of what in the total numbers, uh, that's, speaking frankly, I found that study flawed. I did not find that the data supported the, some of the findings that were presented in that study. Some of the senior admin here in our organization say the same thing. Uh, I happen to be at every rank from constable to superintendent at one of, well, at Ontario's third largest police service in charge of, at, by the time I left, of strategic services, which included planning and auditing and business analytics and data analytics. And I know what it takes to do that type of a study. I don't believe that what that study produced for us was truly what we needed based on what I've been able to review and what I've been able to see. Uh, I think it was a great baseline. And that's why I'm not coming to you today with the types of and the numbers that they asked or they suggested in year two, we should be coming to you with. Because have I blindly adhered to that particular study, I would be hitting you up for a lot more officers and civilian staff this, this particular request. I believe in being responsible, looking at what we need based on the data that I can mine, based on the data we have and the information that I can get from my staff to provide you with a responsible request. And that's why 10 is the number versus what they would have recommended this year. Okay. Any further questions for the chief? Chief, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for all your hard work and uh, team, your team. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here as well. All right, so we do have a recommendation just to receive for information. Moved by so moved. Mayor Leo. And again, we'll have comments and discussion and debate uh, next Wednesday. Moved by Mayor Leo, we'll take a vote.
he's in it. He's in it. Great. He's, he'll be the next guy. To yeah. yeah. Okay. And that is carried. All right. Do we have anyone here tonight from the innovation cluster? Oh, fantastic. It's Camila, right? Camille, welcome. I'll just per perfect. Perfect. So good. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh yes, please. Sorry. Thank you very much for having me today, uh, everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Camila Duarte. For all those of you who haven't uh, met me yet, I'm the executive director at the Innovation Cluster. And today, I won't take you that much of your time. I try to be as quick as possible. Um, I appreciate the opportunity for having me tonight, uh, just to give you a refresher of what the Innovation Cluster is doing and our ask for tonight. Um, just a quick refresher. I know most of you know about the Innovation Cluster, but the Innovation Cluster has been operating for 16 years or so or now, a little bit more than that. And we've been going through a transformation. And this new phase is completely different what you've seen so far. So I thought very quickly, I will give you an update of who we are and what we do. So we are a non-for-profit organization that support entrepreneurs in launching, growing, and scaling businesses. Um, we have changed recently our mission and vision. So our mission is really to drive technology-based, innovation-focused and entrepreneur-led economic growth and job creation by fostering and supporting new company formation and growth. Uh, this is a refreshed view for our mindset strategic plan. And uh, we really look forward to work with the city in this. We do this through programming, acceleration, and incubation programming. We do it uh, locally. We do it outside of uh, the province, Ontario. We attract companies internationally. We do it through colleges and universities, and we, and we impact as well high school students, putting entrepreneurship as a, path, as a pathway in the earliest stages, starting from grade 7 to 12. And this is very good for you to know because we're very much aligned with the city. Uh, we recently changed our new strategic direction and we have a clear vision. We really want to propel growth and entrepreneurship across the region, establishing Peterborough as a center of innovation. That's our mandate, that's what we want to, and we really need the city to support this uh, vision. Um, I mentioned our mission and our values go with the values that you have mentioned in your strategic plan as well. Uh, we work with uncompromising integrity and authenticity, inspiring creativity through collaboration, adaptability, resilience, and thought leadership. We do that through working hard on the ecosystem that we have built throughout the years. We do, on, uh, we do work uh, globally, nationally, provincially. We keep Peterborough in the map, and we want to continue doing that. We work on five sectors, uh, clean tech, agri-tech, digital tech, healthcare, social innovation, with the possibilities of growth, scalability, and more opportunities for, for Peterborough. We have companies at different stages, ideation, discovery, validation, efficiency, and scale. The opportunity for us is to bring companies from customer zero to customer one, make them a scale, and bring economic growth to the region. What we have accomplished so far with your support the last couple of years have been a lot of jobs. We have created more than 900 jobs. Uh, we have impacted the economy uh, with more than $50 million, and we have supported more than 360 companies. We've done that through COVID. We, uh, I think we were successful in pivoting during that time, um, and we continue doing so. Right now, to date, we are being... Um, we are working with 148 companies to date. Uh, we have created more than 200 jobs. This is part-time and full-time. The companies we work with, they hire people. So we support them, we mentor them, we help them to get there. And we have had an economic impact of more than $5 million between the sales, personal investments, equity investment that we mentor and help our companies to get. And this is a quick 
client sample of what we, uh, what type of companies that we work with. We have clean tech Reaper there. We have manufacturing make stuff move. We have software development, uh, student support. We have um, a more clean tech and new technologies coming at us, asking for help. Actually, today Arc Motors, our um, clean tech company, was launched and they showed the 1974 Bronco refurbished with uh, an EV approach. So we have tons of clients, a lot of innovation that we continue working with, and. To this day, with uh, media pickups and press releases, we really are putting Peterborough in the map uh, nationally and internationally. We are events focused, so we know that to attract businesses to Peterborough, we have to be out there. And that's what we've been doing the last 10 months. Um, we have had more than 24 media pickups where we champion our milestones of, and the milestones of our clients. Uh, we do press releases co constantly and we work closely with media and we're getting traction. We are growing our marketing efforts tremendously, which only talks and speaks about uh, our um, our milestones with companies. So we've been pretty, pretty proud of that. Uh, we have had minister meetings, all of that in the media. We announced the partnerships. We announced contests for students showing how we support the youth. Uh, we're going across the country for conference, partnership development and networking opportunities. I've been uh, doing uh, the due diligence to go to the East Coast ecosystem, to King Queens ecosystem, and to make sure how and what is working in the cities of the future. And what I found is that the uh, incubators and accelerators are one with the city, and that's what we want to. This is the Innovation Cluster team, a small team that has worked tirelessly to continue to deliver our mission and, and vision. Uh, we went for two or three staff members uh, a couple of months ago. We are growing our team again because of course our services demand a lot of work and we want to grow and amplify our efforts to continue supporting the economic development in the, in the, in the city. We have extremely uh, great leadership behind us and experts in our fields and the business fields and understanding the ecosystem. Those are our board of directors who support everything we do. We have key partners who literally support our companies to grow and accelerate that grow exponentially. Someone who wants to start a business might take a year. With us, they take two to three months. And we do that through key partnerships from funding to uh, mentorship to helping funding manufacturing space, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, we have our core funding partners, one of them being you. And so I want to really um, expose today that we have accomplished so much with limited budgets, with COVID, with labor shortages, with limited resources. So imagine what we could do if we had a more sustainable, scalable support from the city. And I want to help you paint that picture for you. So just in one year, if we get your support, um, the direct impact will be on job creation. We can support 50 companies regionally. That means in Peterborough, each of them usually have two team members per company. That is a total of 100 job jobs created. Oh, sorry. And the average company uh, dependence is about 200. We do uh, attract a lot of companies out of province and into the region. We do that in average from 45 to 60 every year. I'm being conservative, so I put 45, but I know I, we attract more. And average 40 members per company. That means each company brings at least four people with them. So that's a total created jobs are about 180. And each company or each team member brings at least two dependents. And dependents are defined by the RCC as family members that each team uh, member brings with them. So that's uh, more than 300 family members attracted. So that means that the economic development will be impacted, higher diversity will be um, present, new jobs are going to are going to be created, uh, you're going to have a retail boost, more families, increased tax revenue to the municipality, more students um, in going into schools, colleges, and universities, 
it's going to be a larger community. And of course, we're going to increase the public transportation usage. That is one of your priorities. Um, and we have a lot of indirect value too, more benefit to what we do. We retain our talent. That's a huge struggle for um, for the for the city. We avoid brain drain, and we literally leverage every single talent we find with Trent University and Fleming College. We also re-engage senior leaders into the workforce. A lot of mentors, they are retired, living here. We bring them back to the workforce. We want to help them continue paying taxes and be part of the workforce, so we have that for them. So our impact really goes beyond innovation. We tackle economic development. We work with youth, soft skills and career development, uh, exposing them to this new pathway of entrepreneurship. We work with senior and retired workers. We know the burden of being an entrepreneur, so we tackle mental health in many different ways. Uh, we work with Procurement Canada, which help us with the diversity and inclusion plans. Uh, we, in, um, two months ago, we started working on a skilled trade acceleration, which means that we're going to help um, trades professional to go into business faster than ever because usually skilled trades not all the time they know how to establish their own business we have the know-how and the knowledge to help them get there we do community building technology advancement and currently we receive 140,000 per year for from the city and we pay back 70,000 so we get 70,000 per year uh, we have a loan to the city uh, for about three three hundred thousand and our ask right now is to ask for a repayment forgiveness for three years, and we're happy to reevaluate this in two. Uh, so we get a 400, uh, 420,000 net for the next three years, 140,000 per year. And this is just to increase our resources and amplify the impact that we have the potential to amplify with a business development advisor salary that helps with the business development piece our weakest area. Even though with our weakest area, we have accomplished a lot. So imagine if we get that support person that continues to bring more business to, to the city. And this position will, on average, will create at least 80 jobs over the next two years. So um, I'm really hoping that um, we can work together on this. We have the potential to transform the city and we need to do it with you as a one strong ecosystem, one team, one community. So I invite you to transform the city with us. We know we can do it and we wanna do it with you. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Great presentation, really appreciate it. So we do have some questions. I have Councillor Baldwin, Burke, Real, and Vasily Addis. Councillor Baldwin. Well, thanks Mr. Chair and thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Um, I wasn't gonna ask the question until the second last slide. So the loan forgiveness, uh, so no payments back to the city for a three-year period. Um, are you paying interest on the loan or is it interest-free? Yes, we are paying interest. And do you know what the, do you know what the rate of interest it's is? about 16000 Mr. Mr. Chair, do you know what the rate of interest is on the payment? Yes, uh, it's about uh, 5%, I think. 5%? Okay. So thanks for that. Um I'm interested in that slide that said you'd be able to leverage that that 420,000. Where I'm going, I'm, where I'm going with that is that um, are any of those starter companies or innovation companies that you continue to that continue to evolve? Um, will any of those ever be in a position to become part of the innovation cluster at Trent University, the Clean Tech Commons? Will Will they ever get to that? that stage in your opinion definitely definitely a lot of them have potential a lot of them are already looking for a space most of the clean tech clients we have they need test the product so i definitely see that potential if we have a lab big enough to put my clients there i would say 100 percent yes because we need a space and we need it yesterday we we need that in order to escalate faster I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Chair, because we've, I know the city's invested about $12 million. <laughs> uh, we have we have the clients to feel it, for sure. Oh, okay, well, I, that, that's <laughs> fantastic, because uh, we're looking for some KPIs of that. Let's get some companies in there and uh, get that building uh, built, and so we can all um, 
uh, continue to uh, to thrive and uh, as you're saying there work together and uh, fill up uh, clean tech commons and, and make it a successful park so that's definitely what we want thank we're you. on the same page thank Thanks, you mr chair those are all my questions good questions thank you very much councillor baldwin for that councillor burke real and vastly at us councillor burke um, thanks, Mr. Chair, to the speaker. Um, oh my gosh, where do I start? I feel like I feel like trying to explain. Like I feel like my grandma trying to understand Facebook, and like I just I like no, but out of no disrespect, but like this is the second time that I've heard this presentation, and and like I I get it at a at a certain level. Yeah. But as a citizen, as someone who represents town ward, yeah. as a downtown small business owner, yeah. as someone who is in tune with the, the issues and the struggles that some of your the cat the catchphrases in, in the slides like like speak to, um, like can you just please, please help me understand and help the residential taxpayer who's supporting this ask yeah. like actually understand what it is you do? Because I would I would I would get zero out of ten on a test if I had to, to, to answer to know what you do. I think that you provide help for a certain type of business. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I can help you clarify yeah. that and I'm happy. We are doing a lot of work to help every citizen to understand what we have because we do have the capacity to help the small business owners. So what we do is to support innovation-based companies who want to grow usually they're first time entrepreneurs, first time business owners, first time um, um, startup founders. So they don't have any guidance, they feel overwhelmed, they come to us, we help them through mentorship, through expertise, to a uh, programming specific that is proven. Every cohort that we have, we improve it in a way that we can escalate and make the companies grow faster. So we do that from zero to hundred, every company goes through the same journey. And what we do at the end is that they either launch their business, they know how to test their technology, and they know how to go to market successfully. That's what we do. Through the chair. So the other thing where my my like red flag about it personally, from my own misunderstanding of it. Yeah. And and but it is it comes from a place of criticism of these types of presentations, which is not meant to be solely directed at you. Yeah. But it feels like there's some overlap here because like there's a lot of like marketing and like like rah 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 and and is this not are these not things that we're funding in other ways are these not things that trent and fleming are also helping people get into the trades and learn about marketing and get like is there an overlap here we have uh, peterborough court the economic development are they not doing this i'm happy to explain that Thank too um, I don't see any overlap with what we're doing we what we're doing is definitely unique to our design thinking, agile methodology, efficiency, all our strategies that are not being applied anywhere else. We are technology-based, PKD works on a small businesses, services and goods. Uh, Fleming and Trent, Trent University and, and Fleming College, we are partners. We help their students to bring themselves to entrepreneurship. We organize the pitch it contest where the student is exposed and coached. We coach the students. We help them get there. They're not exposed to entrepreneurship. It's very theoretical ba based. What we do is very practical, hands-on. I have every semester uh, trained students coming to an internship with us, and most likely they want to stay with us because they're exposed to that professional skills that they're not being exposed anywhere else. And I think nobody else is doing that. And we know that we can amplify those efforts and bring even more impact to Trent, to Fleming, to any anyone in the ecosystem from the city because we're not overlapping. We're definitely creating something new and we know the knowledge and we have the expertise to do that um, and accelerate that. So I don't see any overlap at all. And then my final question is about the list of companies because I didn't recognize any of them. Um, are they just sort of niche companies? Are they companies that would like um, be people working out of their houses? Are they companies that would have like a, a building and staff? Um, can you just like in a broad stroke explain that the, like what these people do? And are these jobs that you help people get set up and established? Or are these people, I think you alluded to it, but are they staying in Peterborough? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I can explain you that. And, and the reason is that 
we want to bring Peterborough to the next level. We want to bring Peterborough to uh, and to position it as a city of the future. So innovation is non-negotiable. Business are, is non-negotiable. So we need to start understanding these companies as the backbone of our economy. Uh, if I look at make stuff move, they need manufacturing space. They are they offer kits for um, kits for um, schools that help them students understand nuclear. Um, the nuclear industry, the clean tech industry, how to build something, how to build a robot. They want to grow, so they need more space. They need, they have a storage space. They have a warehouse. Yeah, they want to stay here in Peterborough. We have Reaper, a clean tech based company, who's looking at a giant manufacturing facility because they're creating a new EV based shipment for commercial transportation uh, type of thing. So that the one example here, then the Reaper one. They they don't have they don't currently have like this isn't an example of someone that you've set up with a facility they're looking for a facility they are looking for a facility they're looking for manufacturing they're testing they're going to test their product uh, they are in the office in our space every day but of course this takes time and sometimes we have clients two years validating the process testing the process. It's it's a giant technology we technology yeah. we're talking. And that's here. just through the chair. That's just the thing to me because like based on the on the quickness of the presentation, I'm like, oh, Reaper, great. They're here. They're set up. They have people working. But then upon some simple questioning, it's like, well, no, they're like they're kind of kind of getting set up. And so that's I guess that's the issue for me is like still is like actually understanding the impact of the the growth and the jobs that are staying here and established. They are, they are. So they're different, as I mentioned, they're in different stages, right? So this one is validation. I have one that has five employees already that they're working here. They're hiring from Trent. I have another one that is scalability based. So they're in 1 million range right now and they just hire about 10 people. So you have to know that they are in different stages and we work with them where they are and we get them there. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Councillor Real, Vasliadis, Lachika, Degay, Mayor Leal. Councillor Real. Um, through the chair, you know, it's it's great at budget time when somebody like yourself comes and makes a presentation, and um, the dollar signs just seem to be going. And I'm my question is, are you in the same building as PKAD? Yes, I am. Would you like to share that with them, your presentation, because your presentation was jobs, jobs and jobs. And when they come, I don't see jobs, jobs, and jobs. But that's what I'm hearing from you. And that's why there's a savings of giving you the money and not PKD because you are giving me exactly what I want as a city councilor, and that's jobs. And that means tax base, that means money, and that means business. So could you please, if you're upstairs or downstairs, go into the office and saying, here's the presentation that you should be giving to the city of Peterborough about how to do bring jobs to Peterborough. Would you do that for me? Yes. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Real. Councillor Vasiliadis. I share the same enthusiasm. Um, what you're bringing to us today is is measurables, right? You're able to tell us jobs and how many companies and how it affects their family and uh, uh, return on investment. These are all numbers that are important to us when we're, so uh, I 100% I, I agree. And yes, you're not doing the same work as PCAD, that is for sure, yeah. because no. you're giving us numbers and jobs and everything else that uh, Council Real was talking about. Now I was wondering if you could tell me the success rate of uh, the entrepreneurs that you, you know, you help create their companies. What's the success rate? Um, and in, in, in a way, like when you look at uh, the failure of, mm -hmm. or the, in the last like three to five years uh, of them being um, uh, after you create them or yeah. help create them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so a company without the support of an incubator has the chance to fail up to 80% when they join an incubation or accelerator program that reduces the time, uh, the rate of failure and the increase of success, it goes up to 80%. So we're talking if we have 100 companies, we have 80% of those companies highly um, probable to be successful in the next three years. Of course, we understand that businesses go out and they have to pivot. 
But because we teach them agile methodologies from the beginning, we are teaching them to pivot as fast as possible. And so that also increases the, uh, the um, successful rate. So I would say 80%. Oh. Um, a lot of companies pivot. How I get a business is not how they leave the office. So they pivot quite a bit of time, and that takes time. Um, but I can guarantee you that the incubation is essential for the growth. And any client you talk to uh, that is at the innovation cluster will tell you, we wouldn't be here without the support because we really support all the areas of the businesses that they need to understand in order to stay uh, open, basically. So, so, it's so a, do you fail them quick in a way at the beginning? And we, or that's how, they, that's how they pivot in a way? That's exactly what I said. Let's okay, yeah, fail yeah, fast yeah. and let's pivot faster. So okay. we teach them that so they can understand that the, probably the first business model is not going to work. It takes three, four, five business model tries and tests, hypotheses that we study through methodologies that we know. So by the time they launch, they have a product that actually people want. So we don't wait to fail to the launch. We make them fail all before they launch through the, that's why we call it validation, just to make sure we're going to the market with substance and potential success. That's great. You no, know, because you could answer that question, 80%, that's an, another good number. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Vasliadis. Councillor uh, Lachica. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, sorry. sorry, my mic wasn't on. <laughs> 145 companies are incorporated. So uh, we have 148 companies registered with us now. So those are the number of clients we're working with right now to date okay. in different stages. So not all of them right. are launching. Not all, all of them are validating. It's different stages. So do you have a number for how many have been launched this year? In, in 2023? Yeah, about five companies. Five. Plus the about five out of the province companies that have landed in Peterborough for either Iran or other countries that are trying to establish their business here. Okay. So, so that makes a difference to know how many have actually launched. Um, I, my question, I have a couple of questions. First of all, how many employees did you have last year when you made the presentation? Uh, three or four. So you've doubled the number of employees. Yes, yes, because we increased the number of programs. Uh, it's a demanding job. We were doing a lot. We were getting out of COVID, which we pivot throughout COVID, and we're yeah. going back to full operational. So are those salaries part of the reason that you're asking for the loan forgiveness for the three years? Yes, I want to get that. I want no. I want to create a new job to help us support the programs we do. Right now, the six people are already stretched and we want to bring another person into the table to focus on the business development advisory services to grow our impact, as I explained. So can you provide any other reason that you're asking for the loan forgiveness? Yes, to continue to support Peterborough and into the economic development and job creation job um, strategy. Okay. but. I, I guess my question is when when we have just five registered businesses in one year, um, is is the fruitfulness um, able to furnish the number of salaries that are part of the endeavor right now? So there is a clear difference between incorporated businesses and launched business. I have about 120 businesses incorporated. So they're paying, they're going to do expenses, they're going to pay taxes. But not all of them are launching because they need work to be launched and to be in the market. That doesn't mean they're not creating jobs because to create a company, you need the investment. So this is planting the seed. For my 148 companies, let's say about 25 are launching this year. But the other 120, they are working. They're hiring people. They're paying taxes. They're doing all the due diligence. They're doing partnerships. They're creating jobs. They're using the city resources. It doesn't mean that because they're launching, they're, they're stale and they're not providing the economic impact I'm talking about. Okay. Completely different. So I'm telling you, 
my 148 companies, they're all providing economic development and jobs to the community right now. Okay, thank you. Second question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, because because you're a tech-based endeavor, um, so many so many companies now are remote, mm -hmm. and the location uh, is in terms of where the base is 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 immaterial. Mm -hmm. So, how if 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 many of these companies are re remote and virtual-based employment, you know, they could be in another country, um, and and the jobs that are furnished are for folks outside of Peterborough. Um, the local tax, tax base isn't increased unless people actually physically move here and contribute to the tax base. So what proportion of, of these people who are part of the jobs that are created are actually relocating to Peterborough and contributing to the tax base? Yeah. Can you provide that data for us? Yeah, of course. Uh, but if, you, if I may, I also want to explain a little bit about that. Uh, I just want to look for the right, for the right. Um, so I'm talking here about companies that want to be in Peterborough. So I work on um, uh, FinTech, uh, SaaS, software development, but I work with CleanTech, AgriTech. So these companies are here because they want to help farm, farms here, or they need manufacturing space. The, the companies outside of the province they bring in families here because they're looking for a better opportunity to leave. So they're not looking to be remote from their countries. They want a better life here. And we, the Innovation Cluster, sells Peterborough every day. We pitch Peterborough as the city that where they should live every day. So they're coming here. So to answer your question in numbers, these 45 companies out of the region, they're looking to establish their family and pay taxes here in Peterborough. Not anyone else, not everywhere else. In 2023, how many people from your work have relocated to Peterborough to contribute to the tax base? So up to 2023, we have 16 companies landed in Peterborough. And I do have an extra slide for that because I, I am having problems. Of course, out of those 16 companies, they have had to leave because either they don't find housing or they have found cheaper housing options elsewhere or they didn't find some reasons. And we survey every single company what they're thinking of leaving before they leave. So some of them have left Peterborough, but we trust that the city is making efforts to make these companies stay. So 16 companies have landed. Some of them have left but they have done everything they can to stay. And I'm hoping that with the housing projects, with all the opportunities that Peterborough is creating, they stay, all of them stay so we can encourage and create those opportunities here. Um, finally, is that 16 in 2023 or 16 since the investment in the innovation cluster? No, 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 2023. Um, can you provide those those 16 companies to, to the council? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lachica. Councillor DeGay? Thank you, Chair Beamer. Is it Camilla? Yes. Thank you, Camilla, for, uh, first of all, for a very energetic presentation. Uh, like uh, my colleague, Councillor Riel, I'm, um, I'm, uh, intrigued by the starting similar, startling similarities between the, the work and some of your presentation and some of the objectives and services that your the innovation cluster provides and that of um, PCAD. And you've made a, an important distinction uh, that PCAD focuses on small business. You happen to focus on small businesses that have a technology base. Uh, I'd like you, could you please elaborate though for our benefit to what extent your organization collaborates with our economic development part of uh, our PCAT. Could you give us some examples how you work together? Because on the slides, on the slides, there's no reference of that organization being a partner, and you're yet you're in the same building. So I'm just curious what synergies, what energies, and how you might collaborate. Because we've had similar presentations from yeah. PCAD, yeah. and they talked about attending conferences, attending conventions, and job fairs, and working with Trent, and working with Sir Sanford, and clean tech. We're hearing similar themes. Mm -hmm. So could you please give us a couple of 
succinct examples of how you work together? Yes. That's my first question. Okay. I'm going to answer that question. Thank you. Um, so we treat it as an ecosystem. And uh, a specific examples I can think of, uh, there are two. One, um, we refer each other clients. Some clients go to PKD and say, I need your services, but they're technology-based, so they refer it to us. Sometimes clients come to us and say, I want to open a restaurant, I want to open a business that is not within our scope at the moment, so we refer them to them. Another example where we collaborate, we share some common workshops such as cash flow or business planning or business model canvas. So we decided this year to say, well, let's separate efforts and not repeat work. And then we taught them um, kind of dividing and conquer. So PKD will teach business modeling and I will teach cash flow and innovation and all the piece that I'm an expert in. So those are the instances we work together. Um, we call it team PTBO. We kind of share certain clients to a certain extent, and then we send them to Community Futures for funding if they're approved. So there are a couple of ways that we collaborate together. If I might, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, then supplementary, would there be occasion that the innovation cluster and PCAD staff would be attending the same Ottawa Province convention or conference? I haven't had that situation. The ones I've gone, I, I, I try to be very active uh, and I haven't seen them, perhaps in collision this year in Toronto. I saw Clean Tech Commons. Uh, I didn't see PKD. Thank you. Um, and if you could, please, uh, Camilla, could you advise council, what is your, your total uh, operating budget for 2024? It's about a uh, million dollars. So a million dollars, of which um, you're asking, if I understand correctly, that we would forgive a loan of approximately 140000 So it's 70000 so I'm asking you to uh, be helped with $140,000. And to clarify, uh, I think Councillor Chica's query, that from that you would could potentially be using some of that to hire uh, another staff person. Correct. So in effect, it's not a loan forgiveness. You're asking for $70,000 more for a new position. That's exactly fairness. it. Okay. And when I say that, if I might, Mr. Chairman, none of my uh, questions are intended to undervalue the very important work uh, that your organization is providing. Um, often some of these or these companies, these entrepreneurs have a brilliant idea, Yeah. but they have to take it from that brilliant idea. And then eventually we hope that they will, it'll culminate in bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. And that's a stat I think it would be, would really help because I believe that's what Councillor Chica was getting at and Councillor Burke, like how, how does this manifest? So how can we see it? Some of these companies, it's information technology. We, we don't see it. So it would be very nice to see bricks and mortar, ultimately bricks and mortar um, um, manifest itself somewhere in our uh, city. That's our objective. We need the space. We need manufacturing space. We need commercial space. We need housing for these new entrepreneurs that come out of the province. So we want to work together. Yeah, we, we have the same needs that you foresee for these entrepreneurs. We know the problems. We know the pain points. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are the extent of my questions. Again, Camilla, thank you for um, a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Duguay. Mayor Leal. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Camilla, thank you very much for your your presentation. A, a question that Councillor Baldwin has kind of uh, uh, stuck with me with regards to you. You indicated a number of a couple of companies uh, that would look at uh, physically building uh, on the clean tech uh, uh, property. We've uh, sunk $12 million uh, and have seen no return to date. So. There's a degree of frustration around this, around this table. What's the barrier of not getting that shovel in the ground and, and uh, pouring concrete? The bear would be the, it's, it's, it's a circle to me. It's, if we don't get, we don't start construction. For me, it's very hard sell to say to a company, wait, well, you need to validate and test your piece of technology, wait three years, but come here and get it. So if somehow we could start building, it's easier for me to make that sale 
to say, okay, I have a space for you. Don't go anywhere else. These are my incentives. These are the advantages to come to Peterborough. Mr. Chair, if I continue about it, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Yole, the Clean Tech Commons have to, I'm looking for the right word here, perhaps be a little more flexible in their approach to, uh, to potential uh, people pouring concrete in the ground. Would that be an apt description? Yeah, I agree. I think our objective is work uh, in partnership with absolutely every organization in the ecosystem. We're open to work together. Our central approach is collaboration, and we really want to work with whoever needs to get on board to make this happen for Peterborough. So we're on board with whatever the strategy works, we will be on board. Just a couple more quick questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, Camille, can you give the history of the loan and how it came about? Yeah, so I came to the leadership position two months ago. I started at the Innovation Cluster three years ago. So that uh, that loan, I know that was before my time, uh, a couple of years ago. And that was uh, some differences between the CAO and when the um, the organization was part of the municipality. But the specifics, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you because that was before my time. What we want to try to do is build up and move forward. And so I'm trying to get the you know, the future ahead. And, and yeah, I wouldn't be able to provide those details. We, we probably could explore that as we uh, yeah. have further discussions. I have one last uh, a question that relates to the announcement today of ARC voters yes. at the Peterborough Regional Airport. Uh, could you uh, could you give us uh, some details about that? Because it's it's a pretty interesting company. It is extremely important. It we are so excited for them. Arc Motors is a company of two, one sister and one brother in Peterborough, who are redesigning uh, classic cars, specifically the Bronco. And today they launched their business officially with the support of Community Futures. And they were our clients. So to your example, this is a company that we brought from zero to 100. And they unveiled the Bronco 1974 with a new motor. Um, they use the same motors that Tesla. It's an EV clean tech based company in Peru, innovating, pioneer on this with a female CEO, which is it's very impressive. And we were part of it. We coached them, we mentored them, we are supporting them. And we say, now they're saying, okay, we need to find more funding. Okay, let's go into investors. We're experts on that. So that is one of the examples that we know that no one else is doing. We are supporting innovation and technology. And it may be new for some people where this is a new field and they're not experts on it, but we invite you to come to our space and be part of the change because we're doing something that is out of the box and is different from everyone else. One last question, Mr. Chair. Camilla, they're leasing space in a hangar at the Peterborough Regional Airport. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it was at the airport. Yeah. Do you know how much space they're leasing? No, I'm not. I'm not sure. I can give you that later. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor Leal. I have Councillor Lachika in Burke. Councillor Lachika. Thank you. Um, just one final question. Um, since um, uh, Mr. Skinner and Gillis uh, resigned in this last year, is there a new chief executive officer been hired at the innovation cluster? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So lots of transitions. The new um, go forward is here. And um, thank you for that information. Thank you. Thank you. It's me. And hence, we have done all the transformational phase. We are with a new strategic plan, 2023-2026. We called it the mind shift <laughs> uh, redirection. And we're excited to do completely new things that help the city. Thank you very much, Councillor Lachika. Mr. Burke? Thanks, Chair. Just one more question. Um, so the example you used, they're actually in the airport. Are how many of these um, 16 companies, like, or of the 148 total, um, are through you in Peterborough, but end up in the county? That's me. Okay. Uh, depends on the support we find finding the space. It's not only that we can provide all the spaces for these companies. It really depends where the opportunity is. We do our best to keep them in the city. But if they didn't find that, we did look, and we didn't find that. So we have to be wherever we need rather than let the company on their own, right? So I go where the opportunity is. 
in that sense, but we're hoping we find more space in Peterborough. Sure, so um, through the chair then, are like, I know what you just said, it depends, but in your actual experience, are companies that you're mentoring and, and building up, are more of them finding land in the county than staying here? Not so much. Uh, so I have some companies who have left to Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto, and there's nothing I can do at the moment. So it really is not even in the county. They go to another province or city. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Any further questions? Camilla, thank you for all your incredible work and keep up the good work. Thank and, you so uh, much. Thank you uh, for being here. Thank you. All right, we have a motion just simply to receive for information moved by Councillor Vasliadis. We'll take a vote and describe. And I think I feel bad, Chief Mello. Sorry, you're going to hate me, but we're going to take a quick five minute break. We've had some requests for bathrooms. So just a quick bathroom break for five, 10 minutes, and then we'll be back. Thank you so much. And that carries.
Sixty second warning. Sixty second warning. Thirty second, thirty second warning. All right, we will reconvene and Councillor Rail will be here soon. Um, Chief Mello, welcome. Thank you for your patience tonight and, uh, and to your team. So uh, if you want to introduce your team as well and uh, welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair, and through you, good evening to the members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to once again be here to present um, our draft budget during the 60 seconds that you gave uh, the warning. I was thinking to myself, I think this is the 10th time as a chief I've presented a budget here. But prior to that, four times as a deputy chief. So I think about 14 times you've had to hear me. And so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity again. Uh, joining me today, I believe online still, is our uh, the county's chief financial officer, Jennifer Stover, uh, otherwise known as my phone a friend when you ask me the complicated questions with the dollars in front of them. and. Uh, the uh, people left in the audience, uh, two of my deputy chiefs, two of the three are here. Patricia Bromfield is uh, the deputy chief in charge of operations, the 911 side of the, uh, the operation, and deputy chief Craig Jones, who is in charge of our community programming and emergency management, so the community paramedic programming, those types of things. So if there are detailed questions or, or require detailed answers, two of the experts are here with me today. Uh, this budget you're gonna see mainly numbers. I've been able to present throughout the year the KPIs from our department. I've talked about our struggles, I've talked about our successes, I've talked about our cost per population, all of those things in the KPI reports. I hope we've been in front of you enough to have given you a pretty good understanding of the status of our service. What we're bringing, in my opinion, is a fiscally responsible budget. It's one that I think continues to set us up to um, be able to meet the current needs for the community and it sets a platform for in the future where we are going to need some enhancements but we're not asking for those in this current year. I think it sets the councils up for the county and the city to be able to fulfill your obligation under the Ambulance Act to provide ambulance services that meet the needs of the community. I think it's in a fiscally responsible way. Um, just in terms of some of the background, again, councils 
or the committee is fully aware. I'll just review though. Uh, this is the one of the joints or the uh, shared services that's um, administered through the CMSM agreement. The funding formula is there, as you're fully aware. Uh, that is divided up between the province paying 50% based on the previous year's council approved operating budget. It's always a year behind. And then the remaining 50% uh, split between the county and the city based on latest census data. The um, included in this budget, you are also going to see all of those 100% funded programs, the community paramedic programming. When I talk about our total budget being $27.1 million, 3.8 million of that is funded at 100% level um, by the province. Some through uh, the federal government, very small amount, mostly provincial, and that's the community paramedic programming. That is all included in this budget. So you'll see uh, what looks like if you look at the past 10 years, a significant increase. It is a significant increase with or without, but when you add the community paramedic programming in there, it's even larger. Um, a couple of things just for sort of maybe um, qualifiers. First of all, I always have to say we're basing our budget uh, revenue from the provincial side on an estimate of what the province should be paying us in 2024. And that again is estimated on 50% of the previous year's council approved operating budget. So that we run risk with that, that the province could change, but so far they've been quite consistent in paying at very close to that 50% level on the previous year's operating. So that's been used as an assumption in this budget. And also just to remind you that this is in the very early draft stages in terms of the county's budgeting process. It will be going to uh, county council. You'll actually, you'll be seeing this, um, aside from the joint services already seeing it, you're seeing it before the uh, county actually does. So those are a couple of quantifiers. As I just said, uh, the total budget is $27.1 million, uh, 3.8 million of that total is uh, the community paramedicine piece. The majority line share as usual is the 95% uh, is our operations. There's a smaller, um, comparatively small capital budget, 1.3 million operations coming in at that 25.8. And again, including um, capital and operating total and including the funded programs. This is, I'll start off with the operating portion and uh, this is the detailed list. I'll get into some of the pressures and some of the savings that we may have seen uh, as we go through this, but you'll see that on the operating side, our uh, ask of the city is of an additional 479,348. That is not the final number because we're asking for uh, less on the capital side. So the total ask you'll see at the end of the presentation is less than that as part of the increase. I just like to highlight in that one where the province now sits at 14.4 million. So when you've added in those community paramedic programs funded at 100%, they've significantly upped their game, so to speak, in the, the services that we're delivering. Uh, so the capital budget, that's uh, as, a, as it is, you'll see some significant increases in salaries. I'll talk about that in a minute, some decreases in some of the other um, operating lines. And again, this doesn't include the capital piece. So the operating, as I said, 25.8 million. Um, it's an increase of 1.6 over the previous year or 6.5% increase on our actual operations, including all funded programming. Uh, salaries are the largest piece as usual. 18.9 uh, million or approximately 73% of the budget is salaries and benefits. So um, not a surprise once again to you that that's uh, the heaviest piece of our budget. Salaries and benefits are coming up this year for a few reasons. First of all, uh, I'll mention that we are in the final stages of collective bargaining. So there is a, there will be a, a mandated increase um, subsequent to ratification of that bargaining process. We also are, um, we're not adding additional resources this year, but we're annualizing an increase in staffing we had last year. So if I take you back our, our, uh, our uh, method uh, to provide additional paramedics on the road has been to phase that in over three years. So in 2022, we added four full-time positions, 12 hours per day. That was funded 100% by the county at that time. They found um, a funding source mid-year. It was mid-pandemic. We were having significant pressures. So the county funded that one up front uh, for half a year. So in 2023, that first 12-hour shift was annualized and mid-year we've added an additional four staff to make that a 24-hour ambulance and we did that mid-year again to try to ease the burden on the levy this is now going to be annualized in 2024 so there's a an increase in salaries 
both because of the contract and also uh, annualizing the uh, the enhancement that we had. So we finalized that this year. And as I said before, this budget does include those funded programs. I'll point out, um, you'll see in bullet two there, it talks about one of the programs funded by Peterborough Police. That's not correct. It's actually uh, Peterborough Police receives some federal money and sends that through to us for one of the programs. That's the last one on the list, the uh, yeah, sort team. So our, our programs that we do have funded though from the province, $3 million on the Community Paramedic for Long-Term Care Program. And that one we understand now is a stable funding source for a couple of years. The second one is uh, formerly known as HISH through Ontario Health. So it's an enhanced community paramedic program. Of course, we're also at the consumption treatment site and the, uh, the MSORT program that I just spoke about. So those come from uh, mostly from the provincial government, some from federal grant, and then uh, a significant amount on the CTS site through our local partners and forecast. In the budget on the operating side, um, you're actually seeing a decrease, which uh, it's a bit of a false positive on that one. Our medical supplies, our drugs, those lines are all up significantly. Um, what we're seeing though in this budget is an overall decrease because we had a lot of uh, front end purchases for the community paramedic programs or one time in 2024. So um, don't get too secure thinking that we're going down with our material costs because they do continue to, continue to go up. Uh, so those again were one-time costs, but they'll be reflected in a small decrease. The budget has some, uh, the operating part has some uh, increases in terms of our contracted services, utilities, fuel, things that are expected and rent and facility and, uh, and financial. So uh, a big part of that is uh, the additional staffing we put on. We phased it in over a few years, again, to try to ease the burden on the levy. And now in 2024, we're gonna be moving those staff into that new uh, Millbrook fire paramedic uh, base combination. So that was the method through here was get our staffing in place, ease that into the levy. And now we're adding in some costs for that station. So that's leased from the uh, from Cabin Monaghan. Uh, you'll see a small increase in some of the transfer to external clients. That's our offload nurse program. That's a straight in straight out the dollar per dollar. We receive the money from the province goes back to PRHC for that nurse. There was a small increase there. It doesn't impact the levy. Uh, some increases in the transferred share reserves. Again, this was to ensure that we have a stable um, capital replacement plan, reserve plan in place for our, uh, for our vehicles, equipment, et cetera. So there was an increase to that transfer and a, a fairly significant increase for our um, interdepartmental allocations. So this is what we're paying for those support services, human resources, IT, uh, finance, payroll, uh, facility. That um, This was really... Uh, increase to reflect more reality of what uh, percentage of the, the county staffing that goes to supporting the service. And also, interestingly, brings it in line with most of the other shared services under the CMSM agreement as we understand their percentages. On the capital budget, um, increasing by approximately, sorry, the total capital budget, approximately 1.3 million, that is down. Uh, again, this is funded through a combination of the shared reserves and uh, funding from the city and the county. The city's funding, um, the ask for this, the support ask is actually decreasing in 2023. So the the total capital budgets there in front of you, 1.3 million, as you see that the uh, change in 2024 is a decrease to the city's, so what we're asking the city for by 116,000. So again, when I opened up saying we we're asking 467 on the operating, we're seeing a decrease on this side. So, um, capital projects this year, Vehicles are the, again, the main um, um, expense for us on the capital side. We have three vehicles to replace this year. We have our vehicles on a five-year replacement schedule. They run, generally run about 300,000 kilometers by the time we uh, are trading them or selling them and replacing them. When I first became chief, we were on a three-year schedule. We've moved that out to a five-year schedule. We've watched our maintenance costs. We watch right down to greenhouse gas emissions, um, cost per kilometer to try to make sure we've hit a fairly good sweet spot in terms of um, uh, the life expectancy of the vehicles. I will say the five years at times lately has been a struggle. We're seeing large repairs like transmissions. So we're continuing to watch it, but right now we're fairly comfortable with the five-year schedule. And uh, again, on the capital budget, a smaller amount, but still significant um, for, there's your total list of the capital uh, equipment purchases. 
but a smaller amount, but still significant on our facilities. We have some significant repairs and maintenance to do on Armour Road with HVAC units, things like that, and roof replacement in Norwood. So that was the capital budget. So again, our uh, our total budget ask of the city is uh, increasing by 362, 557, or about 5.8%. Um, again, I understand there may be some difference in the numbers in your budget book, slight differences. This does get adjusted from time to time as we're going through the county's budget process. And of course, we'll always endeavor to keep you completely up to date on that and share that with you. This has gone to the Joint Services Committee. Um, they've reviewed it and um, made the recommendation to move it on to the city and county for budget deliberations. So it's been through that, uh, that, that group. Um, I did, if you do get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, I did because I don't like to leave here without giving you all those pieces of data that I like to talk about. I did provide some slides in there. I'm not gonna go through them, but it talks a little bit about if you wanna go back and review our pressures and our, uh, our uh, performance in the past year. That's in the package for you, uh, but hopefully that's pretty front of mind for you from the KPI reporting that we've done already with the city and with joint services. With that, Mr. Chair, pleased to take any questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that presentation. Councillor uh, Real, questions? To the Chair, to Chief Mel, thank you very much for being here. Um, probably in the same question I asked the police chief, and that has to do with uh, how many... Um, how many of your um, your paramedics are off injury and how many um, presumptive legislation because you fall under that uh, first responder type of that. So how many people are off uh, injured? How many uh, fall under the presumptive legislation? Through the chair, we have um, approximately, the number is not uh, right in front of me. So I'm going to go from... Uh, can give you an estimate from where we were with my last report. I get a report from Human Resources on leaves fairly regularly. So from the last report. So put it into context, we have about 80 full-time staff and roughly another 80 uh, part-time staff, so 160 staff members, and then the management group on top of that. So let's say 200 staff total. At any given time, we may have up to 16, 20 that are actually off on various forms of leave. The majority of those for us are actually um, maternity, mat leaves and parental leaves right now. We do have a number of injuries as well, though, that are under WSIB. That brings it down to about eight of my staff, roughly, that are on a WSIB claim. So if that number drops significantly, there are others that are on claims from other employers, part-time paramedics work with others. So I think the number you really want to hear is the, the number of my actual staff injured in my employee, and that's about eight. I would, I'm gonna tell you that it's not all presumptive legislation, but I won't give you a number because the number gets small enough that they're almost identifiable individuals at that point. You know my staff, you know how many are off. I wouldn't tell you how many are on a, a mental health claim, but it's not all of them. We've put in some significant um, programming in place at Peterborough Paramedics that I'm really proud of to try to address and, and relieve that. I think our numbers are reflecting successes there. Um, when you look at I'm sorry if this goes on too long for you, but this is something I really like to talk about. When you look at the sources of stress, the chief talked earlier, the chief of police about those critical incidents and we too see those. We have zero control over when that's gonna happen. We know that that's going to affect staff in emergency services, all public safety personnel. But the other pieces are organizational and operational stresses. Operational stresses are call volumes, missed breaks, all of those types of things. We know that that exacerbates the the uh, reaction to the critical, critical incidents. So we're doing our best to try to monitor the types of injuries we're having, to try to facilitate breaks, to try to do that kind of stuff. Many of the reasons I'm coming to you for enhancements because that actually affects that. The greatest one though is organizational stress. It's around the, uh, the quality assurance, the hammer approach, and, and we've, we've made some significant moves to try to change the organizational culture You've probably heard about our uh, therapy dog that we have in place. Not something I would have jumped to in my in my career, but I now see how that's affecting the mental health of our, our staff. So I'll go back to the numbers. I think our numbers are good. Um, anybody being off with under something that's presumptive legislation, so mental health claims, it's a bad thing to happen, but I think we've put some supports in place to actually improve that. And I think our numbers are pretty good. Long answer, I apologize, but I think it needed all to be said. So thank you. To the chair, certainly the question I wanted to ask, and certainly I brought it up at the liaison committee today or the city and county, 
that has to do with the offload problem at the hospital. I mean, if you go by there now, I think that we kind of nipped it in the butt. We went to the ministry. We got some money to hire nurses for the offload uh, problem at the emergency. It looks like we're back into that scenario again. Um, in your job, do you are you meeting with the hospital to try and address having a number of ambulances stacked up and paramedics waiting around to for the offload? Do you have meetings monthly or weekly or whatever to try and get the hospital or find out what the systemic problem is, why they can't offload patients that are coming in and stacking up in a whole bunch of ambulances and uh, and staff? I'm not going to say standing around, they're, they're there doing a job. So it, do you have those kind of meetings? Yes, Mr. Chair, we do on a very regular basis. We meet with the hospital to discuss ways that we could try to um, help alleviate the problem. It's, it, this is not a paramedic problem. You've heard me say this many times, uh, Councillor Riel. It's not a Peterborough problem. It's not a PRHC problem. We're seeing this everywhere. It's a system capacity problem. So we meet on a regular basis to see if there are ways we can work with the hospital, um, developing protocols like an offload to the waiting room. If, if somebody comes in by ambulance, they're very stable. We assess and you know, we work with the hospital collaboratively to do those types of things. It's a small change. So if you've heard me say before, all changes are one degree at a time. That's a degree. It's changing it to a different direction. We, uh, Deputy Chief Jones has developed a couple of different programs where we try to avoid going to the hospital. Um, we've worked on a, an opportunity to transport stable overdose patients to the CTS site where they can actually be monitored in a more appropriate environment, hopefully be exposed to wraparound services rather than go to the hospital. We've used some, um, I'm still hoping by the end of the year at surplus, but right now surplus budget to put a supervisor in the eMERGE to work with the charge nurse on a regular basis to see how we can accommodate patient flow, better understand the uh, current situation for the ambulance service to, to know how many we vehicles we have available like to communicate better. We're doing a lot of different things like that. The province is supporting um, with some, well, first of all, the community paramedic program is supporting this. So we're taking uh, hopefully less patients to the hospital for um, relatively minor conditions that we could help them uh, in the home. So, you know, that's another method to look at it. In the end, the province needs to continue in my mind to support um, patient flow and patient volume within the facilities. We need to look at a, doing a better job in Ontario at uh, taking people to the appropriate place. It's not always the eMERGE. So there needs to be work done with, by the province on that side. There also needs to be work done by the province to support paramedic services that are regulated by the Ministry of Health to find alternate destinations, treat and release at home, those types of things. So. To answer your question, there's a lot of conversations happening. We're trying to do a lot. Uh, PRHC is a very cooperative partner with us. I, I, uh, I understand the situation they're in and I appreciate their uh, level of collaboration with us to this point. Has it made a change? It's gotten worse. Call volumes are up. Patient, uh, patients uh, coming into the hospital either by ambulance or walking in continues to get worse. I don't know how much worse it would be if we weren't working together. And my last thing, would it do us any good to send a letter to the Ministry of Health? And you say it's it's just not a Peterborough problem, it's a provincial problem, but it's a provincial problem. And I asked the question of PRHC, um, will there be an improvement at the hospital? And they said it's like trying to turn an ocean liner. Um, so this is looks like it's a systemic problem with the health system that we have in Ontario, and just not in Peterborough, but across the province of trying to address this because you said, I think you said yourself, it doesn't matter what hospital you go to, they're they're doing, they're doing, facing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So would it do any good for us to send a letter to the Ministry of Health saying, look at um, what, what are you doing from your end to try and address this? Do you have the right people to solve the problem? Sure, you know, I think there's, uh, there's always opportunity for advocacy. I think, you know, that's uh, in terms of, Supporting the healthcare system in general, I think there can be some advocacy. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more bold, stick my neck out a bit, and say things like advocating and using that as the reason for advocacy for things like a CHC. You know, having that type of support in the community, keeping people healthy before they end up in in the hospital. I think there are various uh, 
various avenues of advocacy that I, I certainly appreciate. I know PRHC would, and I think your community would, that are all related to patient flow, patient capacity, and having um, better primary care resources that all contribute to this problem. Thank you very much, Councillor Real. Councillor Burke, questions? Yeah, through you, Chair Beamer, um, to Chief Mello, thanks a lot for coming. Um, I guess you kind of answered my question, but I was gonna ask about um, if the work that you do or this budget or the, the sort of challenges that you guys are facing, are they affected at all by the local doctor shortage? And I, th I think you said, are you seeing people that would call you for things that have escalated because they don't have a doctor or they're calling you for things that aren't an emergency? And again, through the chair. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, there's no, it's, it's pretty black and white that if people had access to primary care, if they had access to urgent care, first of all, the primary care often wouldn't get them into the situation where it becomes a 911 call. So they find issues before they become a 911. An opportunity for urgent care rather than emergency care would, would be the next level for us. We don't have that in this community. I think um, we've had a number of success stories with Deputy Chief Jones's community paramedic program where uh, it's been showcased in, in some areas where things have been identified because the community paramedic noticed someone's uh, health deteriorating enough that they were soon to be a 911 call. Um, you know, so I, we have evidence that even that level of primary care has avoided 911 calls. So physicians, access to physicians, access to nurse practitioners, access to even virtual uh, visits with physicians, all of those things will ultimately affect our call volume. And I think I can stick my neck out and say the ER and hospital volume as well, and patient flow volumes. Yeah, so we're, we're at, through the chair, we're basically essentially treating people's things that could be solved sometimes by doctor's visits with the, like the most expensive tools in our toolbox, right? Um, I like how you were speaking through the chair about the, like di diverting people from the ER. Um, when we were at AMO, we saw a really great uh, an example of that in London, Ontario. Um, are you guys connected to the RAM clinic? They've just extended their hours. Are you taking people there at all? Through the chair, I'll start. I don't know if the deputy would have anything to add that um, comes down to his level of expertise. We currently don't have an option to take somebody to the RAM clinic. Um, I think when we see the um, uh, in inpatient beds available where there's an actual um, uh, opportunity to take somebody to the the uh, the in, in patient beds uh, we, I think we would be able to do it currently I don't believe there's any opportunity to go to the ram clinic I was right yeah that's interesting in 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 my other world of recovery like when people are trying to sober up and stabilize from very precarious situations where they're physically um, attached to their substances that's the place that we take them like all day long yeah if I could just to, to add to that, um, it's the residential treatment facilities that we we lack. And if we had that open and ready, there is an opportunity for us to work with the Ministry of Health to have that alternate destination strategy like we have to the CTS site, but to a residential treatment facility. So we will be definitely looking forward to having that opportunity because it it's going to, not just the piece about the hospital, it's in the offload delays. It's about getting people to the right care where they can see those wraparound stable services and not end up repeating a uh, crisis, which is the 911 call. Thank you very much, Councillor Burke. Councillor uh, Duguay. Thank you, Chair Beamer. Uh, Chief, thanks for your presentation. Uh, and the valued service you provide to our community. Can we go to your second slide? Yeah, it's the orange and blue, this one, that one. Yeah. So the second bullet point uh, speaks to the city and the county fund the remainder of the, the budget based on a pro their proportionate share of permanent population. So I want to, I'm gonna ask two, it's a two part question. Could I conclude thusly in the city, it would not include Sir Sanford or Trent University student populations? Through the chair, correct. That's the census data. So it's okay. that that's that hard to publish data. This is the latest census data, so the population. And then similarly, in the county, it would not count the seasonal cottage population or tourists. That's correct. So the formula isn't then based on 
of call volume. So the number of calls from the city are originated from the city or county. It's based based solely on a permanent population using census current census data. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Do you get any further questions for the chief? Chief, thank you so much for uh, for being here and all your work and to uh, your team as well. Pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So we have a recommendation to receive for information. Moved by Councillor Hakey. We'll take a vote in East Scribe. And that is carried. All right, thank you. So uh, we uh, we are going to defer the uh, presentation by Peterborough Public Health. So moved by Councillor. Just wait till Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Moved by Councillor Riel that the presentation for uh, Peterborough Public Health be deferred till November 22nd, 2023 Finance Committee and that the report be updated with additional information, financial information as identified as report on November 22nd agenda. So moved by Councillor Real, we'll take a vote. And that is carried everyone, motion to adjourn. C Councillor Purnell, we'll take a vote. We recess next week. I know it's true. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you Monday at 6. Thank you.